Walker. Um, I got a message that recording is in progress. All right. Uh, so again, thanks everyone for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Nick Hobley. I am um, based out of Mauston, Wisconsin, and I'm the uh, basketball chair for the WROA. So I'm happy to share um, my knowledge with you. And um, please, if there's any time you do have a question, you can pop it into chat and either Brian or um, Kent will give you a heads up on that. We can talk through things. Um, or feel free, if you do have a question or comment about anything, you can come off a of mute and just uh, call it out to me and we'll be happy to discuss anything um, that we have. So tonight we're just kind of um, doing a quick review um, of a couple of rules here. Um, we're going to talk about out-of-bounds plays and out-of-bounds administration. Um, and we're also going to look at um, just a little bit about free throw administration um, at the very at the end if we do have time. So first of all, we're just going to kind of just Talk about out of bounds um, administration. Um, this is a this is a time for us to, as officials, we can collect ourselves. Um, one of the things that I that I teach when I do um, clinics during the summer is, if the game is getting fast, where you you seem like you're getting a little frantic, your job as an official is to go even slower. Um, and I know it feels it feels counterintuitive, but if you slow down just a little bit, everyone just kind of takes a deep breath um, and you're allowed to kind of get back on track um, for the game. Now, all that being said is that um, dead balls aren't a time where we stop officiating, um, but out of bounds plays are a good time for us to kind of um, recollect, um, get everyone back on the same page um, and just take a deep breath. So first we're going to uh, look at tonight um, is just out of bounds spots. Um, where do we put the ball in play when we have a violation, when we have a foul, when we have an out of bounds situation? Um, because putting that ball in play in the right spot goes a long way to building credibility um, with the coaches and the players on the court um, to make sure that we always know where that ball is coming into play. So anytime that we have a violation, um, we go through the, the, our initial placement, we stop the clock, we give the signal, we point the direction. And then the last thing we do is say to our partners, hey, the ball is gonna come in at this spot or it's gonna it's going come in at the end line. Um, and that just gives everyone a real good flow to the game and know what's gonna happen next. So if you can see my screen here, I do have just the um, kind of the National Federation diagram for um, out of bounds placements. Um, this again is the front court. Um, if we're the back court again, it's, it basically is mirrored um, in the backcourt here. So if you do have a, something goes out of bounds in a lane in the backcourt, you of course would just take it out on the end line on that end. Or if it's on the sideline, then you take it on the sideline. So from the National Federation, um, from the rule book, it says the ball will always be placed in bounds at the same spot that it goes out of bounds. If a timeout, foul, or violation is called, it will be taken from the nearest spot. So wherever the ball is, when we call that, um, call the violation or where the violation occurs, that's where we're going to take the ball out of bounds. Um, if it's a timeout, it's where the ball was when the timeout is called. Um, if it's a ball, if it's a foul that's off the ball, the ball would come and play where the foul occurs, not where the ball is, but where the foul occurs. And so I'm just going to um, play this first clip here for you. Um, and this is just an indication of that it's important for us to indicate where we want the ball um, as a calling official um, so that everybody knows where they should be lined up here. So um, again, if, you're, if your internet is a little spotty or if this doesn't come through cleanly, um, you can, I'm gonna share the, uh, the link to this page real quick um, in the chat so that everyone can just click on that if they want to just kind of follow along with what I'm doing or click on the links individually if they're not working very well over Zoom. So I'm just going to do that for you real quick. That should be in chat for you. So let's just take a look at this first play. So foul was called um, in the in this area right here, um, right next to the lane line, kind of between the second and third mark. Okay. So call the foul. Um, it's going to report it. 
you see the official down here calling for the ball, calling for the ball, because um, he's about to take it on the end line. And then all of a sudden, we're now taking the ball on the sideline. So when this official made his call, he just stopped the clock with a fist in the air um, and then just turned to report the foul. He didn't communicate to anyone where the ball should be coming in play. Um, and so no one knows where they should put the ball. No one knows um, where the ball is coming into play. Because a lot of times coaches are going to want to know, am I calling a sideline play or am I calling a end line play? So that's important information that we got to give the players on the court and the coaches on the court as well. So if we look at the uh, diagram here, the fall occurred between the second and third lane lines, right next to the lane line. So this ball should have been given out on the end line where the official was calling for the ball. So this is just one of those important um, things that we just got to kind of make sure we make as part of our routine. Um, Cause I think it is a advantage to a team to take the ball out here on the end line, as opposed to the sideline. Anyone have questions or comments on them? I just, I just wanted to go over that just because um, that's just good information to be refreshed on. Um, and as if your partner calls something, it's helpful to kind of help them out with where that ball is coming into play. Um, you know, and just be really vocal about that as well. Hey, Nick, how hard do you push on that? If, if, you know, the guy's calling for the ball and the guy tries to put on the sideline, do you like blow your whistle? I know it's down here. Or... Um, it, it depends a lot on, um, you know, if I get the attention of my partner and say, hey, you want sideline, you want end line, you know, and ask them where they want it. And that might just help them out a little bit. Or, I mean, he didn't make any indication of where he wants the ball. I think as a lead official there, I, you know, I say, hey, end line, balls on the end line, balls on the end line, um, you know, and, and get that ball there. It looks like that's what the lead official wanted to do, um, but the ball just kind of got bounced to the sideline um, and they just took put it in there. Um, I think this is one of those easy things where just put it on the end line. I mean, and just be just be aware um, of that. If that, if that I think that answers the question. You bet. And I would be um, I would try a little harder to get the ball where it goes if I know for sure. You know, if it's if it's in this overlapping area, if it's right in here, you know, if it's right on that edge, um, I'm not. May, I won't. Maybe won't be as strong a word, but it, that was pretty clearly in this area here. Or you know, if it's in the block area, we're not going to take it on the sideline. We're going to get that in on the block. All right. So real. Just I just want a real quick refresher of that, uh, just because that is a a thing that can make us um, look really good is when we indicate right away where that ball is coming into play and that we're right on where we are indicating it. So another thing that um, we like to really kind of make sure that we do well is have the right official call the um, ball out of bounds. Now, sometimes that gives us a problem where the ball goes out of bounds and we don't know who it goes off of. So you know, how do we go about asking for help? So I'm going to show you the clip and then we're just going to um, open up for discussion on, on what um, you might do when you want to ask for help or the best way to ask for help if you need it. All right, so I'm just going to replay that one more time here. Oops. Uh, replay, there we go, replay. So the ball is um, on the center side. Lead rotates over, we rotate. Um, ball's kind of on right in the lead's primary there. Uh, but the ball does end up going out on the sideline. So the correct official blew his whistle. The center official blew his whistle, went on the sideline. But he has no idea who that's going off of. So he looks to his part of the lead, whose primary it was, and say, hey, I need help. Um, and he's just, and then the lead doesn't go to him and tells him who it went off of. The lead is now just making that call, right? The center has no credibility on making a call here. 
like he indicated to everyone, I have no idea what this call is. I called it out of bounds. So at that point where he's asking the lead for help, the lead takes over and says, all right, I got the call. It is white ball. And he just signals away. He may even blow his whistle and signal here. Um, if I was going to change one thing about this play um, as, as the center official here um, is I would not make the hand signal here um, in terms of the, hey, I don't know. Like he's saying, I don't know. I would just say, help, help. You know, I would just kind of make eye contact with my partner, say help. And then my partner knows at that point just to make that signal. Um, and so that way it isn't, you have a little bit better mechanics, a little bit stronger mechanics in terms of um, what's going on with this official here is that I don't know, because that just, it, it looks bad if you're in the crowd and you see an official go, oh. So I feel like if you just use your voice and say, help, help, that's a better, um, a better indication of what we should see in this play. Does anyone have any other ways that they would, um, that they personally um, would call this play as a center official, what they would do um, if they do not know who it went off of? The only other thing that I would add, Nick, is, and I put it in the chat too, is to reaffirm the help signal. So when the lead points and says, white ball, then I would also point and say white ball. Yeah. Just as a reaffirmation and it just looks smoother because technically I am the calling official. Correct. It is my sideline. I just don't know what I don't know. So therefore ask for help and then reaffirm. Yeah. So that would be, it's important just to, um, as a calling official, because normally if you're going to change your call, the calling official has to do that. So if you, so if this center official would have made a call, um, in this situation, let's say they would have went green, okay? The lead official could come to them and say, hey, that went off of green, it's gotta be white ball. I'm here talking to you, we gotta change the call. In that situation, the center official definitely has to make the call because he indicated which way it was gonna go. In this situation, um, I think reaffirming it is just fine, but everyone in the gym, everyone watching this film knows that the lead has made this call. And I think properly so, right? If we, where does that ball come from as the lead? You know, that's the lead's primary. It's in the, it's in the post. That ball comes directly out of his primary. So that is, I think, the proper mechanic on that one. Anyone else have another way that they uh, might ask for help or, or officiate this type of play um, that they have an experience or have? Um, some indication of? Yeah, I could add, I had a play like this recently, um, almost identical. Uh, and it was on a throw in and I was watching the center, the middle stuff. And then the ball just comes trickling out of bounds. I put up my hand, I yell, help. The lead looks at me with that like blank stare. <clears throat> so I was like, oh shit. So she just, I think, guessed and pointed, you know, the other way, like guessed it was touched. And then the crowd in their bench and a lot of people started, you know, protesting. Right. So I got, I, I think we can use that information. Right. So I got together with her and I said, uh, based on everyone's reaction around us, I think, you know, it's the other way, you know, we're going to go the other way with it. Just blow your whistle, reverse the call, Boop, blew the whistle, reverse the call. Everybody's happy. Go to the bench. And the coach's like, yeah, that was totally the right call. And so I'm, my point is, yeah, we can, use other information, right? The crowd's reaction, you know, um, to, to help inform us as well. Even the body language of players. Yep. Yep. Sometimes, you know, <laughs> girls, girls in particular, I noticed this, they're not as good a liars as the, uh, the boys. They'll oftentimes start walking the other way or they'll look the other way. And it's like, that is, that's a pretty good indicator that I can point that direction. Yeah, so. exactly. So on that one, you know, if you, like if you're getting asked for help, you really have to not make any indication that you don't know as well. Now, if you don't know, maybe you get together and you talk about it very quickly, but then you make a call. But it's, it's important because now if she points the, the, a direction, but she's not really sure, you know, and the, her body and her body language or his body language says that, the credibility comes down. So you got to really, um, when your partner asks you for help, if you know, 
sell that call. It's important to sell that call because now you're kind of the secondary official. You just got to do just a little bit more than what is normal. Um, and if you don't know as that secondary official, you might need to get together with your partner and say, hey, I don't know. And so you have two choices at that point. You make a call or you might need to get your third, your, your third guy in on that to see if they have an indication of what it is. You know, sometimes he's going to be able to, you know, you get together and you got to make that call. Um, you know, and again, worst case scenario. And again, worst case is if no one on the crew knows and you can't use any body language with any degree of certainty about who it's going off of, the rule book gives us the out of calling a alternating possession. But that is a tough pill to swallow um, on that one. So use that one as a very, very, very last resort. Um, if there's anything you can use to, to give a direction, give a direction. Or if you are that secondary official, make a call. Better be 50% wrong than 100% wrong. Hey, Nick, did uh, Austin School District not pay the light bill? Um, I'm in my classroom, and so there's a motion detector in here. And when I'm sitting at my computer, um, my, the lights go off if I sit here too long. So if you do see me get up and the lights turn on, that's what it is. So I'm going to move on to the next clip. And as you guys are watching the next clip, um, I'm going to stand up so the lights turn back on. All right. Uh, so just moving along here, because I do want to get through a few more clips. I do have a couple uh, you make the call plays here. Um, and so all we're going to do for the you make the call plays here is type in chat um, what you would do in this situation. Um, and so I'm just going to play this one right here. Is, so the you make the call is... Is this legal or illegal? Legal or illegal for when you see the clip here. So here's the first clip that we're going to do. Is this legal or illegal for this play? Hey, it's me again when I recorded this video. <laughs> All right. So again, really quick, let's replay the beginning of this because we're looking at just the throw in part of this. Is this a legal uh, throw in here? Is this legal what the white player does? All right. So let's look at the chat here and see what people are saying. So I see legal, 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 legal. And pretty Sign much everyone. Sign him up. All right. Perfect. That's exactly what we should see here. This is really, really great. This is legal. Does he lift both feet while he's throwing that ball in? Absolutely, he does. That's legal. There's no uh, traveling rules for a ball, for a person throwing the ball in. The other thing to look at on that play is he is well off of the court when he takes that throw in. So I'm just going to pause it up here. Um, so, you know, the black is kind of the edge of the court, but there's space behind him. And he lines up in that space behind where the official um, is pointing, right? Is where he's getting that spot throw in, right? He's, you know, 10 feet almost behind where the sideline is. With a designated spot throw in, it is a three foot spot from side to side with infinite depth, depth. He can go as far back as he wants um, for this play. So this is important to know um, for spot throw-in. So good, everyone, on that one. All right, I got one more here. And I think um, some people are going to recognize this um, from um, something that was in vogue here um, a couple of years ago here. This is last year, as you can see by all the masks. So is this a legal throw-in? Is this a legal throw-in? Don't you have to give a little more info there, Nick? Well, let's see if the official gives them that info that they're looking for. Good call. Mama. All right, so based on what we see in this, is this a legal play?
I'm seeing it coming in as legal, legal. Um, some people are making a additional thing. This is legal as long as it's not a spot throw in, as long as they get to run the baseline. Um, it's not indicated if you can run the baseline by the official here, but um, we're assuming that since no official made a call here that this is a legal play. Um, and this in fact is legal. Um, if this is a, um, a out of bounds play after a made basket, this is a legal play. Um, this kind of came into vogue um, a few, uh, like last year, maybe toward the year before, um, where a college team did this. And um, as long as this is after a made um, free throw, this is completely legal. Um, he runs the baseline. Um, he could, what else? He also could at this point, um, in addition to running the baseline and having everyone out of bounds here. The other thing he could do is he could run to this side, pass it to someone else who's still out of bounds, and they could pass it in. Hey, Nick. Yep. Just to add another layer to this play, um, because we know that this, these types of plays are layered. Um, let's say that during this, running the end line throw in the ball is not legally touched. Let's say K let's say the black team kicks it and the white team calls a timeout and comes out of the timeout. Do they still get to run the end line? Mm, good question. Anyone want to, anyone want to answer that before I do? I think I spoiled it while you were uh, talking, Brian. <laughs> oh, you dirty rat. You. Or made after a basket following a defensive violation. Correct. So if the um, ball is not legally touched on the throw-in, so if it's a kicked ball, um, the offensive team does not lose the privilege to run the end line. Now, if it's legally touched in bounce and there's a violation or the ball goes out of bounds, even if it's back on the end line, since it was legally touched and bounced, it's now a spot throw in. Um, this is a play that um, I think got a lot of notoriety. Um, and the only problem was it that some teams tried to run it out of a spot throw in. So let's say, for example, that you are this official right here. This is a spot throw in, and this is what you see. What do we do? I wouldn't give them the ball yet until they were legal. Okay. So preventative officiating, like right? we're not going to give the ball to the out of bounds player and immediately blow the whistle because we have an illegal throw in. Preventative officiating is going to tell us, let's get them legal. Hey guys, you got to be on the court. You got to be in bounds. Hey Nick, just a heads up. You got 10 minutes. Excellent. Thank you for the keeping the time. So I would say that I would make this legal. No different than on a free throw, if someone is standing out of line, I'm not bouncing that ball to the, um, to the free thrower until that person is legal. At least that's my goal. Um, every once in a while, we forget that sometimes. Um, we go into automatic pilot on a, on a free throw. Um, so we got to make sure that we keep things legal um, and just prevent those violations from occurring. Because we know it's illegal. Why are we letting them do it? Now, if we tell the person, hey, you have a spot throw in, and all of a sudden they take off across the back of the lane, well, we call the violation. We told them. So that's what we're going to have there on that. All right, good discussion there on that. I'm glad we got some Nick, discussion there. Nick, real quick, can you talk? So we got an end line. He's running the end line. Yep. You got a five-second count. Yes. Where are, you, where are you putting it in for the new team on the end line? So, for, so on this, you're saying if he runs the end line and is on the other side of the lane and I have a five-second count. So he, so he runs the end line here. Let's say he doesn't put it in play and it's he's over here when the five-second count occurs is what you're asking? Yeah, just in general. Is it, is it where they're at or is it, is it, do they have the choice of which side? Um, it's the rule would say the violation is where the, or the ball would be put in place where the violation occurred. Um, so I guess I would not give them the choice. I would say the spot where the ball was, where the player was, would be where I give them the ball. Um, 
That is the spot. It's just not a designated spot. Correct. That's still the spot though. Yeah. So that's what I would do. That's a good one. Yep. Good question. Yeah. All right. Um, one more clip. I'm guessing before we get to the end, we may not get to the free throw one, um, but you're more than welcome to um, take a look at that one on your, um, on your leisure here. So we're going to probably end up with this clip here just because we're going to uh, make sure we get the time for the coaches. So this is after a made basket. When does a five second count start? And so we have um, this clip actually is three clips in one. So we're going to take a look at them real quick. And just in your head, when should the five second count begin on this play on each of these situations? Okay, so that's clip one. Here's clip two after a made basket. And here's clip three. All right, so let's discuss when should a five second count begin? So in the rule book, um, as, which, is our, which is our ruling document. Um, the five seconds shall count when the ball is at the disposal of the thrower. Unfortunately, they do not define the word disposal anywhere in the rule book. So now this is our judgment. When is the ball at the disposal of the thrower? Oops, wrong one here. I'll close that one, sorry. So if we look at the very first clip, right, ball's in. When is the ball at the disposal of the three thrower? Is it there? She walked past the ball. Now she's reaching down and getting it. When does that five second count begin? Who would like to start the discussion? There's a couple different um, instances when it says that it's <clears throat> at their disposal. So on a free throw, um, you know, when the, when the free throw has the ball, um, like on a normal throw in, like where they're lining up to run a play, it's when the player is handed the ball. Um, a made shot, the rule book does say um, it is at their disposal when the ball is available to them. So again, Nick, like you said, we have to use our judgment to figure, you know, when it's available. Because let's say this girl, you know, she decides she doesn't want to take it out and the other player runs up right away, grabs it and, um, and wants to throw it in. That would be an instance where, you know, you could wait till the one player has the ball to begin the throw in count. But on this clip, it's available to her for quite a while. And you can see the player kind of looking around and planning where she's going to throw it. So in this case, like right now, she's kind of looking around and it's available to her for a while. So I don't know if I want to like look at this and tell you when to pause it to, you know, when you should start it, but that's kind of what I, and we've, I think we've talked about this before of, you know, when is it available to them? And Correct. it's no, definitely available to her in this case before she has actual possession of it, in my opinion. Yep. So that question is, when would we start that five second count? It's when it's available to her, right? If she's walking past the ball, it's available to her. Like she can reach down and get that ball. So we could start that five second count sooner. Now, here's the one thing I'm gonna, gonna kind of say here. This has the clock stopped, right? This is after a made free throw. Clock is not running, okay? Compare that with the second clip here. This is a made basket during the live play. Clock is running. Is that going to be, is that going to influence our decision on when we start a five second count? Or should it influence our decision? It probably will if it's the team that's on offense has a one point lead and there's seven, eight, seconds left they might just want that clock to run out and you know now you're flirting with game manipulation 
versus game management. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be aware of the situation here. So um, just because I want to make sure we do end up here, my opinion on this one, if the clock is stopped, um, especially in this first clip here, we are one minute, seven seconds into the game right now. I am not going to get all over this player right away. Okay. This would be a conversation that I would have with this player at some point and say, Hey, on out of bounds plays after made basket, you gotta be, get the ball a little quicker. Okay. You can't just watch the ball. Okay. So uh, that'd be a conversation to have with us. You could also approach it two with different ways. They could, they're getting longer to set up their press break, but the defensive coach would say, I have longer to set up my press. Yep. And then, so again, you talk about advantage gain versus is, who's getting, who's getting the advantage here. You know, if blue doesn't have their press set up yet and white's letting that ball dribble around and letting the, and letting blue set up the press. If I'm the blue coach, I don't care how soon they get that ball. You know, that's one of those, you know, delay situations. So the game situation I think here really does matter. Um, but if you look here, this, the first one was a minute, seven into the game. This one is, you know, just over eight minutes into the first half. This would be something that it looks like they're going to do all game long. So we have to either address it early so that as Brian says, if we get to the second half, one team's up one point and wants that clock to run out. If we haven't addressed it and that's happened five, six, seven, eight times, we no longer can address it at that point. We set the precedent that we're allowing that. And so that seven or eight seconds might run off the clock. We can't change it, you know, at the end of the game. But if we address it in the first half, a minute in, say, hey, you got to get the ball a little quicker or simply just start counting. Um, that gives us the ability at the end of the game to rule like we need to rule. So that's where I'm going to end up on things here is, um, and this might be something that you might have to pregame, you know, and this might be, have to be something that, you know, after a timeout that if you're the center official here, um, you might need to talk with the other two officials and say, Hey, this is what I saw, how we're going to address it. So that might be something that the crew needs to get together on, you know, for the it's early in the game, you know, or at halftime, you know, if you get together at halftime and make that call um, and you come out and say, Hey, you might need to let the coaches know and say, hey, this is something we saw in the first half. Please let your players know that we are not, that this is not something that's legal. They're going to have to get the ball a little quicker or we're going to start the five second call quick so that everyone's aware. All right, I'm going to sign off here. I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, so that we can get going to the main event tonight, I hope. Yeah, we should almost have like a, like a drum roll or something. Um, so, one of the things that we always look forward to, it's a treat um, for us as officials. And it's also been received as a treat for the coaches is our ability to network with them. Um, I always say that coaches want what we want. And I was fortunate to be a coach um, in conjunction with being an official. Um, my name is Brian Kenny. I'm uh, with the Wisconsin rivers officials association. I live in Wisconsin Dells and I love being able to, find ways to connect with coaches. And I know um, Nick is um, going to facilitate with me tonight. Uh, Nick is from the Arrowhead Association. So Nick, if you want to quick turn your video on and maybe introduce yourself, and then we'll go ahead and introduce our coaches. Hey, Pack here, Arrowhead. Um, we normally meet out of Cameron. Um, our Arrowhead president is Tim Whitaker, who actually is present now. Um, in here, um, we we meet in person usually um, twice a year uh, before the season starts. Now we do uh, weekly weekly quizzes, video stuff like that, and uh, we brought along a uh, boys coach from Rice Lake, uh, Kevin Orr. I couldn't tell you how many years he's been there. Uh, we do our Arrowhead camp out of Rice Lake in the summer. Kevin's always been very nice about helping us with that. And then Chad Eggert is now the girls coach at Clear Lake. He was at the Richmond prior to that. So I know uh, the 
group from uh, Arrowhead will recognize them and we know and respect them very much. And they are very good official or uh, coaches to work with on our side. We appreciate you guys here and uh, look forward to our conversation we have. And uh, from our, our area of the state, um, we, we have three coaches. Um, one of our coaches was going to go to the Badger game, but I think he was a little bit more excited to be with us. So um, we're pretty excited to have him here. So we have uh, Scott Egan is with us. Um, Scott's the head girls coach at Hillsboro. So welcome, Scott. And we also have uh, Brad Solberg with us. Uh, Brad is the head girls coach at Darlington, uh, which is in Southwest Wisconsin. And then we also have Scott up and up with us from Royal. Mm -hmm. He's the head boys coach. So we have two coaches from uh, the scenic bluffs, and then we have a coach from uh, the swall. So welcome to all of our coaches. And uh, while, while you get a chance to chime in on questions, that would be a good time for you to maybe introduce yourself and let us know more about yourself and who you are, maybe what your role is outside of coaching if you're employed by the district or if you work in the community. Um, so basically what Nick and I are going to do is we just have a series of questions. We're not going to have all the coaches chime in on all the questions. We're going to just, we have it strategically planned out. Um, Scott, you're going to have to work on the fly with us. Um, we were able to uh, have you uh, kind of work your way in with some of the questions that I'm going to ask. So I'm going to turn it over to Nick and he's going to go ahead with uh, our first set of questions and then he'll let the coaches know as they can go ahead and answer. Nick, you're muted. <laughs> That's good. So we'll let, we'll let Chad go first here because he's, he's a little younger and uh, Kevin looks better. So we'll make Chad go first. Uh, when does your perception of an official or the crew officials begin? You know, I, we, we walk in the gym usually around an hour before tip off. We're on the court 15 minutes prior to tip off. But when does your perception of an official begin? Um, <clears throat> well, I guess, first of all, I'll just kind of introduce myself. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm the head girls coach at Clear Lake. Um, previously, the last three years, head girls coach at New Richmond. Before that, I oh, it was probably six years JV coach in Amory, uh, another six years of the freshman coach in Amory. Uh, I think I started 30, 25, 30 years ago as the C-Squad boys coach in Glenwood City. So been around the game a long time. Um, on, and more of a girl's perspective, I guess, uh, um, than boys, but, uh, basketball is basketball, I guess. But, um, when does my perception start? I, I you know, this was, I, I thought about this one and I, I actually, I always look up who's officiating the game. So I go to the website and I look, and if I know the officials then they tend to be good officials and I'm like, Hey, awesome. I got a good crew. I, you know, um, I usually, to be honest, I don't hardly pay attention when they, when you come into the gym, um, I might look over, Oh, yep. It's the, the crew that was on the website. Um, other than that, I, I, you know, uh, the thing I, I, I got, I thought a little harder and I thought, well, when they, when you come to greet us, uh, you know, at the, whatever one minute mark, uh, if, if there's some body language, like, you know, an official just doesn't seem to want to be there. Um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, I, I guess it tend for me, it tends to kind of be maybe older officials that are just, all right, I'm still doing this. And, and, and I'm all right. And they don't show a whole lot of emotion or, or true, like, Hey, how's it going? Good luck tonight. Um, you know, obviously everybody could be having a bad day and it just, you know, is that way. But, uh, I, yeah, I, I guess I don't really put a whole lot of thought into, you know, taking a look at, you know, a perception before the game gets going. Kevin? Yeah, my name is uh, Kevin Orr, and I've been here uh, head coach in Rice Lake for 22 years. Um, two years as a girls coach, and now I'm on my 20th year um, as the boys coach. I teach elementary FIED here in the district. 
Um, and um, so I've been here for a long time. You know, um, kind of just picking back off a of chat a little bit, I mean, you know, I was kind of, you know, thinking about that. And I would, and I think too, like as a coach, I mean, if you're new to coaching or first couple of years, you may not know, you know, the crews or a lot of the officials, but like for me, I've been around for a long time, you know, um, so I, I know a lot of the crews and, you know, to be honest with you, I would, I would say, yeah, there is sometimes a perception even before you get to the game, you know, on who you might be having or what. So, you know, but um, I, I think, you know, like even when you arrive, I know you said you arrive an hour early, you know, hey, some officials might come to you, hey, how you doing, coach? How's it going? You know, make small talk, especially obviously if you have a relationship with them. It's probably a little different, but, you know, I think that just um, that friendliness, even before they even take the court, you know, um, and, uh, and I was even like what Chad said, even like when they come over before the game to shake your hand, you know, just the officials that are, Hey, how's it going? Friendly, you know, everybody properly equipped, you know, how's, how's the family going, how, whatever, just kind of making that, that, that small talk, um, you know, I, I think is important. Um, but I just think that that face-to-face -face conversation, like, Hey, you know, are they, you know, excited to be here? Um, their body language, you know, so, but that, that, that that's kind of my thoughts there. Thanks coach. Um, you're welcome. I'm going to have, uh, I think I'm going to have, uh, Scott, um, answer this question first. And then we'll go to um, Brad and then um, Coach Apana. So we got, we got two Scots here. Um, so Scott uh, from Hillsboro, if I were to say an official does this and I like it, what would it be for you? Um, I think one of the big, th first of all, Scott again from Hillsboro. Um, I've been coaching. This is my eighth year at Hillsboro. Um, I actually got the job right out of college. So I've been at Hillsborough all eight years. I'm the seventh and eighth grade math teacher there um, and have been in the district. I taught fourth grade my first five years of that, that eight. And then I've been teaching middle school math the last, the last three, um, all on the girls' side. So I've been with the program for quite a while. Um, you know, I think one of the biggest things that I always appreciate with officials is, you know, and, and I coach with a lot of emotion. I'll be, I'll be blunt about that. Um, when officials can talk to you uh, and, and, you know, understand that, you know, especially in certain types of uh, times of the game where it's going to be emotional um, when they can talk to you, give you a reason why they made a call the way that they did um, under control. They don't try to kind of have a power battle with you. Um, I've always appreciated that with officials, even if they don't. And, and there's been times where an official says, yep, you know, I saw it differently and was, but was calm and, and respectful about it. That's something I've always appreciated with officials like a lot of the guys said, just the communication aspect of it from, um, you know, from the, from the officials and just understanding that it's an emotional game um, and just being super respectful to the coaches and understanding that, that the stress that they're in during the game and things like that and um, kind of helping them through that. So, you know, sometimes you get officials that, in my opinion, you know, kind of try to show you up or try to have a power battle, you know, with you. And that can be super stressful, too. Um, and I've had, you know, we have a lot of the same officials in the scenic bluffs area just because we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. Um, so I've gotten to know a lot of them. And, you know, overall, we've been pretty, pretty lucky with the officials we get. But, but you know, um, that, that's my biggest thing is just like we've all talked about, just the communication aspect and how, how respectful officials are to us as coaches. So um, that's what I've always appreciated about the officials. And like I said, for the most part in our area, they're pretty good. So thanks, Scott. Uh, Brad? Brad froze up, I think. We'll come back to Brad. Scott, why don't you go ahead and let us know who you are, and then um, you can answer this one. Uh, yep. Uh, Scott, up now. I'm uh, middle school, high school principal at Royal. Um, I've been coaching the boys there for, I think this is year nine. Um, I did some head coaching at Lafarge for three years. Um, JV coach at Cassville for a few years before then. Um, so I've been around the game pretty much my whole life. Um, th there's quite a few things. I, I think the number one thing is communication. I know Scott hinted on that. Um, but the ability to, to be able to communicate co to, to an official 
whether it's a concern or a question, and then get that response back from that same official in a calm, in a calm way is important. Um, one of the other, other things is, I guess for me, it, 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 it's somewhat of a show, but it's, it's mechanical being able to, to be strong with the whistle, to be able to be strong with their mechanics and, and, and control the game. Um, I think sometimes, and especially probably younger officials, sometimes to a certain degree are a little cautious on their whistle and don't blow as loud as they should or not solid with their calls. Um, those are, you know, mechanical things. I think that when, when you do them correctly on the, on the basketball court displays confidence. Um, and anytime that you are, have a, you know, a confident official, um, I, I think the game is going to go a little bit smoother for you. Um, I also think that when an official comes up prior to, and this is a little bit maybe of the perception that you guys were talking about before, but when an official comes up and they, the first thing they say to you, hey, we're going to work hard for you tonight. We're going to do whatever we can. We're going to make sure that we get the calls right, not necessarily the first call. So whether that takes a second to communicate with each other to make sure that you do get it right um, versus I did have an example of a, of a recent game and I was a little put off. It was a big game. But the pregame conversation with the, with the official was basically this. You worry about the coaching. We'll worry about the officiating. It'll take care of itself. And, and it, was, it was a big game. Um, and I was a little put off that, that to me, that meant don't, don't talk to me during the game. I don't want to hear from you. You do your job. I'll do ours. And we'll go about our way at the end of the game. And that's how the game kind of started. Um, so I, I, again, I think it goes back that first perception of, of the official when you walk in. Now I signed the official's check, so I know who's coming in that night. And to be honest with you, your first perception is usually a carryover from your last perception. So you, you do have a little bit of an influence on your last experience with them carrying over into your new one, whether that's them with me or, or them with, you know, us, with, us with them or them with us. So it, it goes both ways. Yeah, that's a good point, Scott. Brad, I think you're back on now, so we we'll come yeah, back I to should, you. It should be good. That was that was good timing on my end. <laughs> um, so yeah, Brad Solberg, uh, been at Darlington High School now for eight years. Um, been working with the on the boys' side uh, up until last year. So I switched over to the girls last uh, season, so my second year. Um, working with the with the girls and still trying to figure out um, how uh, this end of it works. So um, thanks for having me, and um, you know, really appreciate what what all of you guys do. Um, so as far as the the perception things that we that we like seeing, um, the, you know, the first thing, and this kind of goes off what Scott said. Every official will come up to us before the game say, Hey, you know, we want to communicate, um, you, you know, if you're seeing things, you know, if you're asking properly, you know, we'll communicate with you. Um, but very rarely does that get followed through with, um, from, from my, my opinion. Um, you know, when you, you know, and I always try to save, if I have a question on a call, I usually try to save it for a free throw. Um, but the majority of time that that official that makes the call is going to stay as far away from you you know, as, as they can, even though they're reporting it to, to the table, but you can see them, they'll float to the other side a little bit. Um, and they just really don't want to have that open line of communication, no matter how you, how you engage it. Um, so I, I guess, so I like, right. The officials that will communicate. Um, and I've got, you know, no problem with, you know, somebody saying, you know, this is just how I saw it, you know, and, and, and I'll try to, you know, you know, whatever next time, but um, just keeping that line of communication open is really important for, for us as coaches. Um, and then the other thing that we, I think we, well, two more. We also really like when officials just say, just give us something that they've got some clue as to what our team is about or doing this season. Hey, so I had a nice win, you know, against so-and-so or, hey, I saw you on film. Um, and that just shows that, hey, you know, you guys are working, preparing, um, and, and whatever. Um, and then the, the last thing is just hustling. I think just as we ask our players to hustle, if we see officials hustling, there really isn't much that we can say. Um, if they're trying to get to the right spots, trying to get, get, get uh, in the, uh, to be able to have good angles, um, that, that's really all as coaches that we can ask for. 
Thanks, Brad. Those are great answers. Nick, back to you. All right, I'll, uh, we'll make Kevin start with this one next. So I'm going to pick three names I don't recognize. So, so Kevin and Chad, you got Ben from Shawano, uh, Bryn Schieffer, probably what's your real name, and Matthew Kleinhaus coming in your gym. So three guys you probably don't know. So if you look ahead, three officials you don't know. Now, these are probably good officials. However, based on your perception, what are three things you might dislike seeing from an official, someone you don't know? What are they? What What can they do that you're not going to like? Um, I'll go first. And, you know, obviously I was preparing for this question. And when I was here at Scott and these other people talk about um, the previous question, I'm like, them are like just spot on to what I was going to say. Like to me is communication is big. Um, and I think your good officials really know how to coach. I mean, excuse me, know how to communicate with the coaches, you know, um, and they're willing to, again, I don't expect them to have long answers, but they're willing to communicate if you ask them something or maybe question something like they're not, you know, snapping back at you. There's nothing that I hate worst is one official like gets, I don't know, gets an attitude towards you and is disrespectful. I mean, that that's like, to me, that's unprofessional. It's just, I, I so I think communication is really big. Um, I, I think officials that, you know, that, that respect factor, um, and I, and I think too, like just being consistent, you know, when you're just being, whether you're going to call it maybe a little bit more physical, um, maybe you're going to call it touchy, but we're going to be consistent um, throughout the game. But like, it, it's unbelievable in my opinion, like when you get officials that are just willing, they're having fun out there. They're willing to communicate with you, you know, just like I can't remember the previous coach says he's pretty emotional into it. I mean, I, I coach that way too, but I, I really feel like if, if I am maybe crossing the line an official comes up to me and says, Hey, all right, Kevin, I, I, I heard you, you know, that's enough, but he does it in a respectful way. That, that's, that's, I'm going to back off. I, I get the point. Um, you know, so I just think that is like the communication thing and, you know, like my, my first three games this year has just been unbelievable. It's just been the officials are just phenomenal. I mean, just, I mean, I, you know, they're talking like one official's like, man, I really like your team. You know, my, I have a son that's playing for me. He's like, wow, that, you know, that kid can really play, you know, and just, we had just a great conversation going on, you know, um, one time, um, you know, this year, just like, I have a little sense of humor and, you know, we, we were on uh, they call the charge in us. I'm like, Hey Mike, you know, wasn't he in a, a restricted circle, you know, just kind of having that, just being fun with it. But I mean, but it's just been amazing. The flow of our last three games. Um, and, but it's because all those officials, they communicate, not just with me, with my players. I mean, like, you know, we are I, I, I heard, you know, in one of our games where, you know, we're defending in the post, we're banging each other. And the, the, the officials talking to them, talking to them. And so I, I just think like that communication piece um, is, is really, really important and just being respectful. So. Hey, Kevin, um, I've never refed one of your games, but I would be willing to bet that based on your energy that you're, you're between the 28 foot line <clears throat> and uh, you're not sitting down much. You seem like a pretty exciting coach. That's, that is true. Yeah, is that is true. Which 28-foot line, Brian? Which 28-foot lines? Brian? Which 20 foot lines? <laughs> not, not the one on the other side, side of the court. table. Uh, Kevin is notorious for, yeah, for uh, his energy. Yeah. But you're great. You coach your kids. We just got to remind you to stay off the court once in a while. That's all. <laughs> hey, Kevin, tell him it's because of your height you have to stay up. I appreciate that, Tim. I appreciate those reminders. Chad, what do you got to add to that? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I think Kevin's spot on there. With like, 
if, if, if officials aren't willing to, to be approachable and talk to you, especially, you know, you know, I, I guess I like to think I do a pretty good job uh, most of the time of, 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 you know, asking questions, being respectful for, you know, clarifications. If I saw a call that was different um, and I absolutely love it when officials can say, yeah, maybe I didn't get that one. Uh, this is what I saw. And I'll say, yeah, maybe I was wrong, too. And, and we go on. Um, and there's not that power struggle. Uh, uh, I've had a few officials over the years that I know, but again, when they're in the gym, they won't say a word to you. They'll run by you all game and you be, hey, sir, or even use their name and, and they won't even give you a look. And to me, that just it gets under my skin. Like, come on, like, come on, like, we're both professionals here that just talk to me. You know, you know just tell me what you saw and, and um and, and to be honest, you know, you know, uh, I, I still, I, I don't know, it still sticks in my mind. Uh, Nick, you were doing one of my games in Ellsworth there, and uh, my point guard, or we were on defense, and and my guard on top, I don't know if we're in a zone or whatever, jumped a reversal pass, and the both girls got there at the same time, and they collided, and I was like, oh, what's he gonna call? And you called my girl for the fall, even though it looked like she was kind of in front of the ball or beat her to the ball and you came over, you know, just like the other coaches have been talking about where you didn't shy away from me. You come over, you kind of stood right in front of me. And I said, Hey, Nick, I, I didn't really care for that call. And you turned around and looked over your shoulder and said, yeah, I didn't really either, you know, kind of admitting that. Yeah. I don't know. I blew the whistle. And I kind of had to make a call. I, I love that stuff. Like, you know, just, okay. Yeah. I'll deal with that all night. If you, you know, if, if you're so did Nick, did uh did Nick do that like eight more times in that game too? <laughs> uh, no, I, I think that was the only one. But yeah, uh, but I've had other officials be that way too. I, I like to joke around too. Um, the, the other night, uh, you know, my eyes aren't great, but we had a ball hit the rim and go way up, and they said it hit the wire, and um, I just said that one really hit the wire as as the official was running by, and he goes, he goes. Yeah, yeah, it did. I said, yeah, my eyes aren't the best anyway. He goes, I just got these new glasses. And he had glasses. I said, well, I'll take your word for it then. Um, you know, and, and things like that. That just, you know, puts a different vibe to the game. And, and, and you know, they're out there having fun. And, and it, you know, makes it a little less stressful for us. And, and you know, I, I, to me, that that's the key, you know. And, you know, the opposite is, is, is just frustrating to deal with. Or, you know, games where I know they're – you know, we play a lot of these double headers where there's not many fans in the stands at 545 now. It's like a JV game. And I know officials can hear me and they won't respond to me or I have to repeat myself over and over and over before they'll come so I can get a clarification. And, you know, I'm like, you know, come on, I'm not going to. I feel like I'm pretty approachable myself. So I, I don't know. I just like I say that that's probably my biggest uh, concern when I see officials. Those are, those are great answers, Chad. Thanks. Who would be noisier if Clear Lake uh, played Rice Lake and Kevin were back coaching the the girls? I know he's coaching the boys. What would that be like? Oh, he, he, he'd be way noisier, especially if we played the 545 game and uh, you wouldn't hear anything else in the gym probably. <laughs> you wouldn't yeah. see anything either, would you, Chad? <laughs> no, we're, you know – we were playing in River Falls the other night, and they do their games live, and they do a great job. But my brother-in-law, who's head coach at Eau Claire, he was watching our game. He's like, I can hear everything you were saying. I'm like thinking to myself, I, I got to be careful because I'm calling all plays. All these coaches watching the game are going to know what we're doing. So, but, uh, but yeah, it's all it's fun. It's fun. Well, thank you. You guys are both been a good time so far, so. It'll only get better. Um, Brad uh, Solberg, you can answer this one first. Um, what do you, what do you, what would you say is uh, probably the, we'll just cut this down to like one or two judgment calls that you think are just problematic and troublesome for officials from your perspective? Yeah. So, I mean, I'll start with the, the state and the obvious, the block charge. Um, you know, that's, that one's always going to be the, the tough one. Um, and I don't know what the, what the answer is there. Um, I do know that when 
the one that fr that probably frustrates coaches the most is when when we give charges to defenders that are basically right under the rim. Um, yeah, and I know we don't have a circle, but you know if we could. Minnesota does next year. And I I don't know if we're ever getting if we're getting closer to that or not. It would be great. Um, but that's probably a conversation for another day. Um, I think my my biggest one is is the, the anticipation calls. Um, or where officials maybe are guessing what's going to happen. Um, and I know basketball is not a sport where you can always have a slow whistle, um, but especially on loose balls or, or um, you know, the, the breakaway layup type stuff. You know, if I th think if officials had a little bit slower whistle and maybe watched it play out a bit, um, that would take some of the guessing or that anticipation away. And then my, my third one is the is the hand checking um, almost, you can pretty much count on it that every game you're going to get a hand check called within the first, you know, minute, minute and a half of a game. And then you're not going to see it again the rest of the game. You know, I think that that probably needs to cool down a little bit. Um, you know, if it's, if it's not really impeding progress, you know, I get still get the two hands on. Um, but, you know, at some point we got to let, let kids play a little bit too. Um, and just some of these things where it's not really affecting a play, you know, just allowing kids to play through some of that stuff. You know, Brad, as you're talking, um, you know, we wanted this to be a, uh, kind of like a two way street that we're traveling down where you guys teach us some things, um, which is great. And then we can teach, you know, you some things and you can teach an old dog, new tricks. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that we like to talk about in the officiating, you know, community, and this is a community, you know, we want what you want. Um, we want the game to be awesome. We want to really develop relationships with your players and we want to be able to network with you during the game. We talk about A to B plays and players going A to B. So drive to the basket where there's a primary defender. And we always talk about seeing the entire movie. And I think you're talking about that when you're saying, you know, too fast of a whistle. Uh, if we don't see the whole movie um, and we step out for popcorn, then we, we get caught assuming and anticipating. And the better your players are at being vertical and being in legal guarding position uh, really enhances the chances that if we anticipate, we might, we might've had a no call and, so that's something that we always strive for is knowing, you know, who established and maintained legal guarding position and whether the contact was initiated by, you know, the offense or if it was a defender who moved in. Um, that's a challenge for us. And it's a challenge for you to understand the, the solution and the puzzle. And it's, it's all communication and it's all something that the more video we look at, and the more plays we see as officials, the better we get at, you know, getting those plays right. So we appreciate the ability to network with you guys because we'll, we'll take something away from this and so will you. So um, Scott Egan, you want to uh, go ahead with some of your thoughts about this? Uh, yeah, I was just kind of thinking through some things while, while, um, while we were talking and one, you know, I have a, it's kind of my first year where we're really kind of, we have a, a really big pole. She's six, four. You do. Uh, yeah. She plays, she plays down low for us a lot, obviously. Um, one of the big things that I've seen some issues with is the consistency on post seals and whether that's an illegal screen or um, whether that's a, that's a legal play. Um, that seems to be one that's not consistently called one way or the other. Some refs like to call it an illegal screen. Some refs like to call it, um, you know, clean play. And, you know, not only is it hard to, you know, talk about, but also it's hard to know what to, to, to teach kids, you know, properly, if that's a legal player, if refs are going to call that a lot of times on us. Um, I think travels, I think travels in the girls game get anticipated a little bit. I think sometimes the, the moves aren't as clean from the girls, but sometimes we, we call stuff on the awkwardness of the move and instead of whether it's necessarily truly a travel. Um, you know, I think refs like awkwardness gets called a lot uh, more than it actually gets called. Um, legitimately so that's that's another thing that I've seen and you know I just think the treatment of uh you know and again this is because probably my best player right now is a post but 
the treatment of posts seems to be really inconsistent compared to a lot of other girls because of their size, you know, especially when we have a girl that's so much larger. She, you know, she plays all back to the basket. Everything's around the rim. Somehow she'd shoot and she's averaging, you know, 18 and 12 for us over the last few games. And uh, she didn't shoot her first free throws of the season until the fourth game of the of the season. And pretty much everything's done around the basket. And so that's something where, you know, I, I you know, even though she's large, it always seems like a lot of times for our posts, um, they struggle to get calls a little bit more because of their size. I feel like officials almost feel bad for some of the smaller girls when they're playing against girls with some size. And so I thought that, you know, that, that's been a little bit inconsistent for, for that as well. Um, the last one is, you know, you know, we, we see a lot of press uh, and especially D five girls, um, you know, it seems like anything goes in traps, uh, where you can get away with anything you want. Um, girls can reach, they can, they can body you out of bounds. And, and usually it's just kind of let go. That's another one that's just kind of been, in my opinion, kind of just look at as, you know, once there's a trap, it's it. Like there is no falling in trap. It's, it's whatever goes. If you fall out of bounds, it's out of bounds. If you reach, you reach. And, and that's another thing that it doesn't seem like that, you know, it, that's another area too, for me. And, and some of these girls, things are really girl specific because you don't see a lot of press in the men's game and, and stuff like that. But, uh, but those are just some of the areas that I was thinking about while we were talking here. So um, that that's what I see mostly on our side. You know, Scott, you have, um, you have a pretty good grasp of officiating terminology. I think you should, uh, you know, maybe come over to the dark side. <laughs> hey, I officiate at the J for uh, on weekends, so I got some experience in it. I'm not anything close to a, a legitimate official, but I've done my own side side money. That's kind of my side hustle, I guess you can say. So that's what I do a lot of weekends. So I'm doing some of it at least. Something that might be helpful to the five of you is a uh, an acronym that we use in the officiating world is RSBQ. Do do if I'll give you guys a. I'll, I'll send, I'll personally send you a, a 12 pack of spotted cow in the mail. If one of you can get this right. I guarantee Chad and Kevin get it. Okay. Chad and Kevin, you are not allowed to answer the question. No, go ahead. If you, if you know it, and that's awesome that you know what RSBQ means. Go, <laughs> go ahead and chime in. If you, if you know, I don't know it. Kevin. Kevin does. I've drawn a blank too, so <laughs> give us give us the R. Okay, I'm gonna give. Hold on, I'm gonna give. Uh, I'm gonna give Brad and uh, Scott Scott squared a chance to get this one right. Yeah. You, you no know, phoning a friend either. Don't be texting. We we need the R. The R is um, rhythm. Scott, up and I check your phone. Don't be doing. Oh, come on, Preston. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I don't have it. <laughs> it's rhythm, not. speed, balance, quickness. It's rhythm, speed, balance, and quickness. So, Scott, you were talking about um, some of the screening. And, you know, as we get older as officials, the, the players don't. And the game is, gets so fast. And chase mode, when players are in chase mode and they get screened, even the slightest bit of contact, if it's – a little illegal can be a difference maker in regards to RSBQ. So that's a term that actually came from the NCAA and it's starting to work its way into a lot of our pregames. And we talk about RSBQ in a lot of different aspects of the game. Like Scott, you were talking about pressure when teams apply pressure. You, yeah, you, you don't want murder to take place just because somebody's really good at pressing. Um, but we're also not going to reward bad offense so if you pick your dribble up in the corner the coffin corner you know that's sometimes we uh we're not going to bail players out either so that's where the communication comes in where we have to be good communicators with you when you're emotional and and we got to be able to explain the terminology so that we have an equitable game so there's just lots of nuances and uh, you guys are answering these questions really well. So, Scott Upana, anything that you want to add to the the trouble areas yep. for officials? They hit on almost every everything that I had down. The only one that I had different was verticality. Um, that's one of the things that I stress with you know stress with my players is stay vertical, stay vertical. 
Um, and matter of fact, I, I tell them flat out, you, you jump and try to block a shot, you get called for a foul, at least around here. Don't look at me like, hey, I got that clean. I, I expect it. So I, I tell them to stay, keep their feet on the floor and stay vertical. Um, lots of times that's not always rewarded. Um, most of the time it is. I, I have to do, obviously give a lot of credit when credit is due. Uh, most of the time it is rewarded because there's a lot of negatives that can happen with, with leaving the floor. Um, but periodically we do come across and, and when verticality is there and uh, contact initiated by, initiated by the offense uh, is a tough pill to swallow when there's going to be a whistle and it's going to be two free throws on the opposite end. That's the only thing that I see that I try to be consistent with how I coach anyway, uh, based on what we do um, and then not rewarded on the back end. And matter of fact, not necessarily not rewarded, but also penalized. That's the only thing that I have different from what these guys had that I see sometimes is inconsistent between groups, between crews. So what's the, here's just a little quiz question. Um, and I kind of like this dialogue that we're having and Nick, when you're asking your questions, feel free to, what's the one thing that a defender, let's say that we are, we are assuming that a defender has um, established and maintained their legal guarding position. And we now have an airborne shooter. What is the one thing that a defender is not allowed to do? Not give them room to come down. They take away their landing spot by doing what? Moving they can go the up. They can go up. Yeah, they can go up to the ceiling vertical. They can go up to the ceiling. And they Fly can go down. laterally and obliquely to <laughs> defend themselves. But what can't they do? Move closer. Move closer. Very good, Chad. They cannot move into the airborne shooter. And that's something that we always strive to get better at is not punishing good defense or re rewarding bad offense. Yep. So we do our very best. And that's why our association and the Arrowhead, uh, you know, we look at a lot of video clips and we analyze just like you do to get ready for the teams you're playing. And I think that's really important for us to do that. And we're pretty lucky. We have two really good associations that do a great job, you know, trying to be better at learning and getting better. And um, it's important for us. So thank you. Great answers. Brian, I'm very disappointed in, in Kevin because he would have actually shared that 12 pack with the Arrowhead next summer at the camp. <laughs> um, Chad would have drank it himself. So <laughs> I don't care what he says. Um, so, but to you guys, Chad, outside of that call in Ellsworth, me giving you the call, is there ways that officials can improve on their judgment? I mean, I, I know you want every call to go to Clear Lake. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you'll get your chance to go every call to Rice Lake. I, I know it's a, it's, it's, it's very blue and white in your guys' scenario, because you're both blue and white. But we got to see through two lenses. How, how do we improve our judgments in your eyes as officials? Um, yeah, this is one I kind of thought about. You know, and honestly, I just look now like this right here, what you guys are doing is, is, is awesome. Um, and, you know, I look down and there's only 44 participants and I'm like, is it, is this a requirement to keep your, you know, I, cause th this, like I, I was on early and I was watching some of the stuff you guys are going over and I was learning things and I was understanding, you know, uh, where, where the proper throw in is for sure. And, and this and that. And, um, and to me, that just goes back to, are you officiating because you love it or are you officiating it, the game because you, you, you know, you, you want to get your paycheck and you've been doing it for a while and whatever. Um, I also think just the networking with other officials, just like we do as coaches, we get together and we talk and we gather, you know, and we talk this game or that game. And, um, and I'm sure you guys do a lot of this, but I, I'm just curious, like how many officials, care as much as I would assume all the people that are on here um, where, where you're really doing your research, you know, and I don't, I know Nick, you had a game of mine in, in New Richmond there where I was kind of upset with another official about the, the, the girl pushed off and then she ran my player over and then, and you had said, Hey, send me that film. I, I kind of want to look at that. 
Um, I, I believe you're still about the only one that's ever asked for the film from, you know, um, I'm curious if other officials, you know, uh, are afraid to do that or is that not, you know, do you encourage officials to maybe do that on certain calls or, or is it just, you, you know, obviously it's kind of, and you were more worried about you where your positioning was and if you could have helped in that situation, but, you know, um, but then we had good dialogue about what I saw and what you saw. And um, so, I, yeah, I think, you know, if, if, if officials watch film, like as coaches watch film, um, I, I think, you know, you'd have to get better at certain judgment calls. I will speak for, I mean, the 44 of us or there's 39 officials in on here. I will say that the 39 on here watched more film than you five think. <laughs> um, Cause we do watch a lot of film and maybe not enough, a lot. Um, and we, same, same as you, like you're watching, you're scouting your opponents. We're scouting ourselves. How, how, yeah. how do we get better? We, we don't get like, like getting yelled at from Kevin up and down the court. You know, we, we don't like the 50 50 calls that go the wrong way. We want to be, how can we be in that position to make the call? And the thing about us is it's not about when we watch a clip, it's not about, oh, Tim Whitaker messed this clip up because of this. It's what could have Tim Whitaker done to not be in a better position to make that call successful. You know, and, and, and you move on like that. Yeah, that's how we try and learn from it. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and, and I know, like I said, I, I'm guessing most of you on here do that. It's just how many of the other ones that, you know, aren't is, aren't in officiating for the right reasons, maybe, I guess is what I'm getting at. And, and just do it to do it and aren't, well, okay, whatever. I might have blown a couple calls, but whatever. Um, so it, it's, it's fun. I mean, I, I forgot. I mean, thank you guys for inviting me tonight because this is, is awesome. So, um, yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure you guys do watch film, but, um, I, there really wasn't a whole lot I could think of, to be honest, like, how do you, how do you get better at being I mean, you know, wanting to be better, I guess is kind of the, my main answer. I think one of the best things about, uh, at least I'll speak for the arrowhead is that, uh, each time we do have a meeting, officials are willing to put themselves out there and mm -hmm. show clips that they may have made a mistake on. We have to make a snap judgment, but we, when you can watch the film over and over, maybe our decision changes, but at least they're willing to do that. And I think that's a big thing to get better. I'll speak for uh, up for the GVOA up in this neck of the woods. And uh, no, Steve mentioned if I did one of your games, the first thing you would have said to me was, why the hell did you drive so far? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't drive to Rice Lake for a game. No offense, born, born in Rice Lake, but Last night, um, we listened to a podcast on the way to our game. We, we had Edgar Marathon Boys. And then today in my lunch break, uh, I'm a math teacher, just like Nick. Uh, I clipped 23 plays out of the game quick on my lunch break. You know, and we sent them to our crew. I sent them to a couple of my mentors. I sent them to Brian, Steve Macheski, and Mark Jander. And just to kind of bounce ideas off. And then our coach at Gresham, Jeff Zolbeck, uh, he pointed me on a couple of plays from his game last night. So I clipped them. Uh, and a couple of officials talked about it. And we talked about to Jeff, he had a backcourt violation on his team after a rebounding situation where there was just tapping. And he knows the rules pretty well because we train him up. And he said, you know, I, I tried to argue my case that there wasn't team control in the front court. I said, Jeff, that's awesome. I said, but what about saying, would you have ever granted a timeout during that situation, during that sequence? And the answer would have been a, for sure no. And then, you know, maybe he could have argued and, and got them to realize it wasn't a backcourt violation. But just, you know, we are, we're, we're listening to podcasts, Brian's podcast, these meetings, clip and plays, sending them to our mentors, fellow officials. We're doing tons of stuff. We are anyway. I don't can't speak for anyone else that's not. Our association this year was fortunate to get a, a substantial donation uh, from two business uh, owners in the Dells. Um, thanks to one of our members who's on um, and we were able to purchase huddle and huddle is not cheap. <laughs> so we have our own huddle account now. So any of you five can exchange with us on a drop of a dime, the same way you would exchange with one another. And we'll go into that huddle account and we have a huge library. Um, so we can get clips. One of our members um, that's on is well-versed with huddle and he 
put together a tutorial that basically shows you here's how to use this beast of a product. I mean, that's a huge advantage for us to be able to, because it's time consuming to clip plays. Cool. So if we've got a bunch of members that are doing that, let's say that I have a little bit of time this week, I can clip some plays and then I can take a week off and somebody else is clipping plays. I'm still reaping the benefits from those clips because we're all doing the work and you guys do the same thing. So again, it goes back to, we want what you want. And if we can just make that happen more that then we would be in a, a really good place and we would probably never fight. It would be just, you know, a lot of, <laughs> we'd have great relationships, right? And nine times out of 10, we usually do. So Kev, Kevin, coming back to you then. So, I mean, next, next week or month, I'm not sure what your schedule looks like, but you got Zach Campbell and River Falls coming to town and you got Clark Billets and the Prince brothers coming to town. How are they going to improve their judgment in your eyes outside of giving 10 fouls against River Falls and zero against Rice Lake? Well, I think, um, you know, the judgment thing, like you said, I think, um, you know, the discussion about videotape, I mean, it just really excites me to hear these officials just how passionate they are, like clipping, you know, things at their lunch break, sharing them, developing that library. I mean, to me, I think if high school, co and, and I'm sure some do, but like, you know, again, I'm sure other officials are more passionate than others. But I mean, I think that, that's awesome because that's how we learn, you know. So I think that's really, really good um, and by watching yourself, you know, and I love the, the fact that what that one official said, he sent it to his mentor. I mean, to me, that's awesome. That That's really, really good. And, you know, so I think that, that would be a big thing, which obviously you talked about. And then I don't even know if this is, you know, just like dirty game, because you might have like a tip ball that you really don't know, but you, you know, Maybe one official goes this way, and we had it, you know, the other day. But I love the fact that, okay, so another official maybe saw something different. They got together, they talked about it, and they got it right. You know, so I think that communication piece, even during the game on a loose ball or a tip ball, let's come together, let's get it right, and let's move on, you know. So those are my kind of two thoughts. Perfect. Um, I'm going to – I'm going to have um, Scott up and go first on this one. Scott, what's a, what's one rule? Just pick one that you know so well because of your team that you just feel you have some really extreme knowledge of and kind of because of the complexities of your, your current team. Um, I would say probably traveling. Is, is one that we work hard on, um, establishing pivot foot, sweeping the ball through, um, making sure the ball hits the floor before pivot foot picks up. Um, that's something that we work on every night in practice. That's something that I, you know, watch the clips and you know, whether it's the jump stop and, and into one and all those other things that we drill every night. And sometimes it's a little frustrating when it's not called consistently against other teams that are not maybe doing it as well as what you're doing. Um, it, it, it's a, probably a little bit of a pride thing that I take, you know, in, into consideration, trying to keep turnovers down. That's probably our number one goal every night is to be under 10. So we, we emphasize that every night in practice. And then to see other teams possibly not be penalized for making mistakes that are maybe not as what, consistently what we're doing that's probably the only thing that I see and to be honest with you it doesn't happen a lot um, by far uh, I believe it's it's called pretty consistently um, but there are a few crews that we know going in or at least I know going in we're not going to probably get a travel call the entire night uh, on either team and I know that's not how the game is typically called and probably not being called correctly if that's the case so but that's the only thing that I I would say that I emphasize to that to that degree every night in practice um, that it isn't called as consistent as I would like it to be. So Scott, if I have one of your games and and we have a play at the rim 
that involves a block charge play, I can look at you and say, Scott, be quiet. You only know traveling. <laughs> if he's vertical, he's vertical, whether he's under the rim or not. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So, won't hear too much. so a good joke, um, since we're all jokesters, is I saw this the other day and we actually posted it on our uh, WROA Facebook page. It was a, I don't know if it was a husband, wife, or a boyfriend, girlfriend. And the girlfriend was like, honey, I want to travel more. And uh, the, the guy says, well, then go outside and take three steps. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> hilarious. Um, uh, Scott, Scott Egan, what do you, what do you would have to say? What's a, what's a rule that you just know really well because of the current team you have. And I, I know you have, we had one of your games and we pregame your, your big girl, because a lot of times they get over penalized for being big. And there were several plays in our game that we had with you where, a player would bounce off of her and it'd be very easy to penalize her for the reaction that happens when the bouncing occurs, but she's not doing anything wrong. She's legal. She's entitled to the space that she has as long as she got there legally. And she does a really good job. So kudos to you for coaching her up for being a, a very big player. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I think you kind of stole what I was gonna actually say because I think all right, especially with her. No, that's all good. It'll make it easy for me. I don't have to talk for long. Um, I, you know, I just again, you know, having a girl her size, which we have not had. Obviously, most teams never get a girl at six four that comes through their program. But teaching her to play vertical, you know, I think a lot of times what I've seen with with posts is they like to swat shots. They like to do a lot of that stuff. Um, and I think that's something that from since her freshman and sophomore year, we've really worked on is her staying vertical. You know, if you can block a shot by staying vertical and you can go, you know, up high, that's fine. But um, that's something that, and again, it's not something that's necessarily officiated wrong. I actually think officials have been very good with officiating her because I can see a lot of officials because she does block a lot of shots, calling a lot of those as fouls. Um, she's actually been officiated very well this year. I've, I've not had issues. She's really not been in foul trouble much this year. And she's again, a girl that, I think right now is averaging four or five blocks a game for us. So, you know, to, to average four, that many blocks and not really ever be in foul trouble, I think is really impressive. And I give a lot of credit to the, the officiating crews we've had because they've, they've allowed her to play vertical. And um, you guys were a perfect example. I think the game you guys had, she had nine, 10, 11 blocks in that game. And, uh, and she was never in foul trouble that whole game. So, you know, I think, you know, our officiating crew has done that, but I would say that's our main one that we've really worked on with our post players is verticality because, you know, in the girls game, if you have to finish over a tall girl, like, unlike the boys game, that's usually not a good result for a lot of girls teams finishing over a big girl where the boys a little bit more of the athleticism that can be a little bit easier of a task. So that's something we work on a lot. Um, and that was my main one. So you kind of hit it on the head before I talked about it. So, so in the Hillsborough Royal girls game, the officials did a great job and didn't miss any calls. <laughs> I didn't say that. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, we're always striving for excellence. So I gotta, I gotta try to, yeah. No, you, you guys did fine. Fish, you got to fish for it a little bit. Yeah, no, there, there's no complaints. So I, uh, I thought you guys did good, especially with a young crew like that. You know, um, I thought you guys did a nice job. It was, it, I, the one thing I'll say is, first of all, when we were talking about what, what we want to see out of officials, I think it's really good, especially officials that are maybe thinking about getting out, um, to try to find a couple young young uh, officials to try to get back to, to replace or that they'll work with for their last year, or whatever the case is. I know you, you, you've talked about this being your last year and stuff and, and having two officials that, you know, to come in and mentor them so they maybe can take your space a year after, whatever the case is, I think is really good. We've had a lot of young officials this year. And I've That's actually awesome. had a lot of, lot of luck with young officials because – I think they're kind of trying to prove that they can, they can handle it. Like I, I actually usually like some of the young officials over the really old officials that are pushing 60, some of them maybe 65, 70, because I think like they're really trying to prove their worth uh, that they can handle the varsity level. Um, and so I've always really appreciated that. I always think they do a really good job. Even if they miss a couple calls, I think I'm more, you know, as long as they're putting that effort in, I really appreciate it. And I, I'm starting to see that this year a lot. And that's been really encouraging um, for our game, obviously. So. Awesome. Thanks Scott. Uh, Brad. Anything? Yeah. Um, so these actually, they kind of rule, these kind of roll into each other um, as far as I know really well. Um, and then I don't know very well at all um, because it's called so differently, but just, just screening in general, uh, we run a ball screen offense. 
which at, at, at the girls level, um, you know, you don't see it a, a whole heck of a lot right now. Um, but, you know, there's always some, some goofy things. So, you know, we, we teach, you know, sprint to your screen, get to a jump stop, hold the screen as long as legally possible, you know, no hips, arms, shoulders, any of that good stuff um, moving. Um, you know, if we talk about field of vision, um, and if, if we don't have that, that um, the, the defender doesn't have the sight of you, you, you got to give a step and all that. Um, but, you know, then we get into some goofy stuff where, you know, maybe we're rolling and we, <clears throat> we seal um, on, a, on a switch um, that'll get called for, for a moving screen. Um, we'll have ones where like the defender will jam up tight to the, <clears throat> to the girl coming off of a screen and kind of get on her hip. And then because they're making contact with our screen, our screener will just kind of turn, um, you know, to allow that defender to get through um, that'll get called for a moving screen. So um, just kind of, like I said, I like know, I, I know the rule really, really well because we see it, we use it a lot and, and whatever, but then it's, there's always, it seems like every night there's something different um, about a screen that um, I haven't seen before. Oh, that's great feedback. And a lot of our video clips that we, you know, we utilize um, involve illegal screens in some capacity, whether they're, you know, screening to free up um, a shot on the perimeter or move somebody through the post. So you guys are spot on with some of your feedback. Thank you. Uh, um, Kevin, Chad, it's nine to two in fouls. Come on. Oh. Are you serious? Call it fair. It's nine to two. Okay, now, thankfully, neither of you are that way. However, the 39 of us, whoever over here, have all heard that. Outside of the nine to two on the scoreboard, which we all know, how else are we as officials being inconsistent? I, I can go first if you want me to. Go ahead, Jeff. That means you have that means you have an answer. Yeah, I got I actually got a couple here because our first couple games have been pretty inconsistent on on a, on a few of these things. Um, first of all, uh, jump balls, uh, man. Uh, held balls, Chad. Held balls. Uh, sorry. Yes, held balls. Yes. Uh, the. I, I know it's it's a judgment call, but it, the, the, our, one of our games this year, it was uh, they'd let them hang on and tug each way, tug each way, and then it seemed like the other team would tug it out and our girl's arm or would end up on their arm and they'd call a fall on our girl. And, and the official was like, well, I gave you each a chance to tug on it and then your girl fouled her. I'm like, well, is that really how it's supposed to be called? I don't – I mean – I know you don't want touch held balls, but at the same point when they're both tugging on it, I, I, and then to have a fall call to my girl, just kind of, and then, uh, so that was, it was consistent the whole game. That's how they, they called it. Um, and then uh, at last night's game, it, it seemed like, uh, and it was maybe more on loose ball, like loose balls where there were held balls. Um, and they would call a, and, and again, maybe I don't know what, what the way it's supposed to be called, but you got two girls diving on the floor for a loose ball. One kind of has it. The other one's kind of reaching, whatever. And they must have caught, I don't know how many calls, well, both ways, even on the other team, they, they were calling reach in fouls. And I just thought, well, let's give them a little leeway. I mean, it's a loose ball. And then nobody really had the ball yet. And we were getting on the arm touch falls called on loose balls, which I thought was pretty inconsistent. Um, is a loose ball a reason I can I can hack your girl? What's that? Is a loose ball a reason I can I can go through your girl? Well, it wasn't about the. It was like they're both on the ground and they're both like reaching for the ball. And you know, it was and like I said, it was both both sides. Like the other, I thought there were a couple cheap ones that the, that the other team got. And I was like, why that? 
they're just going for the ball. I don't know why we need to be calling fouls here, but, um, but I would say my most quite the thing that I question the most is, and maybe I don't know the rule on this, but officials call when, when, when a girl is gathering the ball and gathers it to go up for a layup and they get bumped or they get fouled is is that a shooting foul? Because it's under my interpretation that if it's, if it's gathered, then that is in the process of shooting the basketball and it is consistently called on the ground. And it happened last night. And, and the, I, I tried to get an answer from the official and they just said they blocked them. And I was, I was like, well, I understand that, but why isn't it a shooting fall? So maybe I'm wrong, but. Is, well, is, is Chad, you have, Chad, I'll, you I'll, have poked you have poked the bear on this one. This is a, <laughs> I, I, I'll let Nick I'll let Nick continue because this is his question. So I gotta I gotta be really quiet on this one because this is my pet peeve. Well, and, and I I hate to speak for for Tim or an association or or behalf of the officials. However, I think we tend to tr try to benefit the offense. I mean, if in doubt, they are gathering and it's, and the problem is it's, it's, it's changed over the rule over the years, you know, yes. back in the day it was, well, it's not NBA. It's not continuation, right. but now the high school has said, well, it's the gathering motion. And I will, and as an official, I, I, I I'm speaking personally, I tend to be like more on the side of, well, she gathered one up. And I get more argument from Chad, you're not you, <laughs> but this will say the Scots, because I don't know the Scots. Hey, she wasn't shooting. No, Scott. She was gathered and in her motion going up. And as the official, and, and I think Tim and, uh, and the Arrowhead, and we'll all say, well, you benefit that as, hey, that's, that's the motion. That's the habitual motion of going up okay. and shooting. We're not going to penalize the offense for getting fouled and right. the ball on the end line. Yeah. But. So I, I am correct then in uh, how it should be called, but I just. Um, You're using all the, the right words. Yeah, send me the film. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in here. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's the motion that precedes the habitual try, right? She got, she didn't gather the ball to pass. Right. right? Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, yeah, we we do as as a a group of officials tend to penalize the offense too much, in my opinion. So um, all of us on this call, are, you know, probably have all heard this, and and will. So, yeah, it's that's continuous motion. We're shooting too. She, as soon as they gather, you know, as soon as they start their any motion that precedes their habitual try for goal, that's shooting too. Yeah, shooting too. Well, and, and I think a lot of times well, she didn't shoot it. No, she didn't shoot it because I mean her arm was held so bad she couldn't. Yeah. Or she, you know, out of she, out of the my twenty three plays that, that I, and then you know they're gonna shoot it, and then just because they threw it does, yeah, it was it was a uh, not a try, you know. I mean, again, you're absolutely right, Chad. I think everybody in this call will, will agree with you, but we also recognize that there are a lot of officials that don't do that. And, they point to the floor, and the floor has nothing to do with it. The floor has absolutely nothing to do with the try. On the floor. All right, I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> out, of the, out of those 23 That's plays they clipped, three, three of them were, three of them were, man, we should have really awarded some shots on that one. Yeah. You know, but it's early in the season. We're shaking the rust off. You go to camps, clinicians, and they're like, hey, guys, why is that not a shooting foul? You know, so, you know, we're always working on rewarding the offense if they have begun the motion. It, you know, and I'll, I'll just say on the girls' side, I think it's a little more difficult call because they don't get off the ground like like boys do normally. So I think it's a little easier call in a boys' game where, yeah, they are actually coming off the ground when they're gathering it, where a lot of times the girls are, are maybe not. So I get it. It's a little more difficult on the girls' side. But um, I just wanted to make sure that, that that was – I wasn't being too stupid about things. But <laughs> and, and, Chad, kind of like we go back to – the original meeting, which you were a part of, which Nick had his display of the shuttle, you know, when in doubt, if there's a question, would you go, do we go end line or go sideline? And I, I know I can speak for Tim because I've heard him say it numerous times. You go end line. Why? Because more offensive, co more coaches have plays designed for the end line. We don't want to penalize them for getting 
a foul called for them. Right. Now we're going to put them on the end line. If it's a question, put it on the end line. If it's questionable about shooting or on the on the floor. Let's let's not penalize the team for getting fouled. Put them on the line. I think we should answer his question about the the held ball as well and loose ball and and that as well. I guess I could start with. We tend to be a little quicker with the whistle for safety, but yeah, there's a real fine line. We can't be guessing um, on when that ball is truly held. And again, the rule book says something about held so firmly that, you know, to try to prevent something bad from happening. Um, but in terms of, yeah, I mean, you can't jump on somebody. You can't displace them, even if the ball is loose and, and there's, you know, uh, on the floor, but yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I you know, without seeing your play, yeah, there, there's some discretion. Like, yeah, just with arms and reaching for the ball. Goodness, yeah. they just we get fouls when they hug them, go completely around them, <laughs> jump on them. You know, those are fouls. But right. otherwise, yeah, there should be more leeway, Chad, um, for yeah. a loose ball when it's they're fifty fifty. Yeah, and and it was I, I knew it was something goofy because uh, when my mom watched a game on TV and the first thing she said to me today was, well, "How do you get a jump ball?" Or why were there so many? Fun? And she, I mean, she watches basketball, but when she was noticing, I was like, okay, maybe I, I was seeing things right the other night. So, but no, I, I get it. It's a, it's a judgment call and whatever, but it's just one of the things I noticed so far this year. Kevin, we I, see, I see we, we lost you for a second, but uh, you're back on. We're kind of talking about uh, how officials judgment can be. Uh, more, more, more consistent outside of, you know, I, I often heard me yelling at you about seven to two and fouls. Outside of that, do you have anything to add on how we can be more consistent? You know, I thought, I think this stuff, the stuff that you guys were discussing um, was really good. Um, and, you know, I, I guess I really don't have too much to add to that question, to be honest with you. So I'm going to kind of, we have about 15 minutes left and we could probably go for another two hours. I mean, I might, I might need a, you know, around nine, nine o'clock or so I might need a spotted cow, but uh, <laughs> you know, I want to ask this question because this is so important. Obviously there's a shortage of both of us, you know, we're, <clears throat> we're uh, endangered, you know, coaches, and officials, and, and we need to replenish. <clears throat> and I say this all the time. My, my main focus as an official at 49 years old is replenishing the talent pool and developing a pipeline. I'm committed to that. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that I do that to my, to my nth degree before I leave. Um, what can you do as coaches? You know, you're going to have a senior banquet or a banquet, and you're going to have seniors that are going to be done, right? Done, done. Uh, not going on to the next level. What can you do that you haven't done? Maybe a new idea, an aha moment to keep kids in the game, to get them to officiate, to get them to coach, uh, just to keep them involved. What's something that you can do better that maybe you're not doing right now? I want all of you to chime in on this one. Let's have uh, Chad, oh. you go first. Cause Chad, you got to look right now that like your gears are turning, man. It, it, and they are. And uh, yeah, and, and maybe not something that, that that's new, but I, you know, from, from maybe not necessarily young, but, but just people in general that like, well, I don't want to officiate cause uh, you know, cause uh, man, the coaches are on you, the fans are on you. And, and I just, you know, I guess I feel like as a coach, if I can be respectful and, and people can see that as a coach, I'm getting along with officials and, and it's, and it looks fun. <laughs> I, I think then there's a, there's a better picture out there for people that want to get into it. Like, Hey, you know, you're not always getting yelled at by coaches and um, you know, you're having a good time with, with, with these officials and, and, and whatever. And, I think if you can at least make it look 
like it's something, you know, yeah, a kid that played basketball their whole life. And I just think a lot of kids get scared of coaches and fans and whatever. So I think the better example we can set as coaches, I think the chances of, of, of a young person wanting to get into it is, is better. Thanks, Chad. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, Brad, I'm going to have you go next because I know that oh. I know that you have an officiating class down at Darlington. Um, so I'd like to hear about yeah. how you you would tap into that class. Yeah, so this will be the first year of it and it's going to start second semester. Um, and, you know, we're really trying to uh, attack those graduating seniors. Um, but I've talked to Kent a little bit about this as well. You know, I think in the state, there's somewhere between like 12 and 15 ish schools that run this, run a class like this. And every one of those classes is making up their own, you know, curriculum. Um, so, you know, as an association, you know, if, if, if you guys, we're able to come out with, uh, you know, some type of a curriculum for schools that may really help promote it. And you'll see that number grow tremendously. Um, you know, I've told Kent several times that we're kind of making it up, you know, as we go right now, you know, it's structured. So, you know, basketball is one of the sports that they will be licensed in. Um, the students will get to take the test through the WIA and get certified for, for free while they're in high school. Um, but the idea of that is to get them some experience blowing the whistle. Um, Scott mentioned, Scott up and uh, mentioned earlier that, you know, he, he likes to see officials confident with their whistle. Um, and I know that that's probably the hardest thing for a young official is to be able to be confident enough to see a call and make a call. Um, so this class will get some get some kids some experience. Um, they'll get certified um, before they before they leave high school. But still, like you, you got to get them on the floor. You know, at, at least do a game um, with a somewhat experienced you know official. Like, you know, we've got grades. I think third grade is is playing games here at Darlington. Like there is no reason why we can't have one high school kid paired with just somebody that's, um, you know, more experienced doing a third grade basketball game. Um, and then hopefully the kids from there are going to take that confidence and just say, hey, I can make some money doing this. And, um, you know, I, I can continue to stay in the game doing this. So um, hopefully from there, you know, they choose to want to continue doing it. Yeah, that's awesome, Brad. And kudos to you. And I've, I've thought about, and Brad, I want you to, I want you to do me a favor and I want you to call Jamie Nutter on the phone at CISA three. And I want you to talk to him about this because this is my dream. Okay. I think CISA should be doing this and we could partner with UW Platteville, for example, and they could, they could host a course on Canva which is the UW systems product for online learning. Yep. And we could make that ham sandwich. Okay. Um, I know Jamie. So yeah, I could, I could make say that something call. to him and drop my name because we've actually thought about creating a steering committee and working with the board of control to say, Hey, there's gotta be some skin in the game from the WIA for this. And, and there's people that have deep pockets that know this is a problem. Um, we're doing a program next year with Mauston. I just finalized it today called the two plus one program where for JV games, we're going to have a varsity official stay down for the JV game and work three person. And Randy Gillen is a phenomenal man at, at Mauston and he's agreed to pay all three officials a good wage for that JV game. And that's our pipeline. We have to have a pipeline. If we don't, we're not going to solve this problem. So this is really important. And that's why I wanted to get this question in because we, if we don't look at our pipeline, we can't rely on the veteran officials at some point in time are going to retire. And uh, 
we got to take stock in our young people. It's the same way that you would with, you got your eye on eighth graders already. Seventh graders, you know, Hey, that kid, man, that's a kid's got a great spin move, man. I'm licking my chops, just waiting to develop his talent or her talent and shit. We got to do the same thing. Hey, Brian, big trouble. Hey, Brian. Yeah. Woody Kibo Arrowhead. Uh, I've been officiating. Kev, Kevin will get a kick out of this. Kev, uh, my freshman year in college, Ed Andrews got me into it. Okay, and I've been fishing ever I'm since. Stout. No, he was at the Mount back then, way back okay. in the golden years. But here's the white elephant in the room, and you coaches will understand this. Um, we do that. I've done multiple high school kids that do the, the Great Northwest League, but that is where the white elephant is. There are so many young officials that have been ruined by those parents that just think it's the NBA finals on a Saturday. And somehow some of them, I'm one of them that survived it. I don't do them anymore. Um, I'll help out and mentor younger high school kids with that. But that's the big white elephant. That's where you're losing 85% of your young officials because they are getting their butts reamed and, and there's no support. Sometimes it's coaches. Most of the time it's, a, it's uh, fans or parents, but someone's got to address that white elephant in the room because the, the, the amount of younger officials, especially with our youth today, they're different than they were 25 years ago. They're not willing to stick it out. So I just wanted to talk about that, that that's a, that's a big hurdle for a lot of those young officials. Part of this, um, Woody, I'm glad you brought that up. Part of this two plus one program involves the varsity official that stays down for that JV game. And this is something we're just looking at doing for non-conference games, just to pilot it will make an announcement with a lot of passion and enthusiasm, like a Ted talk and just say, Hey, we want to honor these officials. They're independent contractors. They do their very best for your son or daughter. We ask that you kindly refrain from any yelling, any bad body language, standing up and pointing at the referees that will be grounds for your dismissal from the, uh, the contest, please. And thank you. And that's your warning. What we permit, we promote. We need a zero tolerance policy from school districts. And if we can do that and we can start getting that going, I think fan, the fan issue will take care of itself because you know, as well as the, when somebody gets made an example of that sets precedence, like, Hey man, don't mess with Mr. Upina. Like you will not win that battle. Do not go to his office. Um, I think that's important. And we, we see a lot of game managers scrolling on Facebook when they are supposed to be managing that game. And that is disheartening for us because we see that. We have very, very in tune skills with what's going on because that's our safety. And that's the safety of our younger officials. And um, I think we all need to really think about that, like getting better, um, Scott, Egan, anything you want to add to this? Um, what can you do? I mean, you're a young coach, you know, eight years in. You've given us a lot of good insight tonight. You're smart. Um, well, no, I, I wouldn't say anything that hasn't been happening. I know some of the, one of the things that we've done, which a lot of them have said, um, you know, we had a couple of veteran officials that are on here, Cade and and some of some of the guys he knew, Preston, and I think was there too, and and some other guys. Um, they came into our school and ran a ran a clinic. It was like six hours for on a uh, during a summer night. We invited as many of the conference schools as we could. Unfortunately, a lot of them didn't participate, um, but they ran like a legitimate class. They had video of tough calls. They had the kids out on the court, um, blowing their whistles. They taught them some hand signals. They did a lot of that stuff. Um, and our school has been very supportive of having our those kids that took that course come in and do junior high games, giving them the opportunities. They're the first people that they ask to give them that experience. Um, Cade's been really good with, with some of the girls he knows from his AU team and stuff like that, asking them to be his partner when he does stuff. Um, that's gotten some of our young officials to really be interested. I think I think some of the the guy that said something about the great north what uh, northwest league that I thought of the cross area. Um, I think the hard thing is when you put young officials with young officials and you don't have anyone there kind of somewhat protecting those young kids too. You know, I think 
it's really hard for those young kids to fend for themselves. And if we put two eighth graders or two freshmen with each other, refing even a, a sixth grade game, I think you have to have someone that's confident to tell a parent to stop. And, and yes, it should be from other people, but I've definitely seen some really good officials where they will make sure they kind of protect those young kids. So I think that's been really good. Um, and so, yeah. And then, you know, like I said, I kind of do a little bit of this on my side, on the side. So, you know, the young girl that's on my team, that's been really interested. I asked her to, to ref. I got asked for Reedsburg's big tournament that they have here for all their youth kids. I asked her to, to officiate with me instead of just kind of, you know, I, I think now when I get asked to officiate, whether it's at the Just a Game or whether it's in Reedsburg or anything else local, I'll, I'll ask my girls that have taken the class if they want to try it and want to do it with me. And I think that's just a way for them to get some experience, you know, giving them them opportunities. Then they get down the list that get emailed in the future and they get that experience. And so I think just giving them, you know, some of it's just like when I first wanted to start officiating at, at the Justin game to make some side money, it's like, who do you even talk to to get the hours? Who do you even talk to to, to, to start doing some of that stuff? And so just introducing those kids to those people too. Um, so they get those opportunities, I think is really important. And um yeah, we've gotten a few that have stuck with it and done junior high games and have done some, they were in Boston the other weekend. So I think that's been really important. And, and then, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I think Cade's been doing a really good job around our area. I would say um, really promoting the scenic bluffs and getting kids involved in that. So I really appreciate that from his end as well. Thanks Scott. That's so important and uh, great insight. Kevin, I know we're going to go over on time, but you know what? Yeah. It might be by five uh, minutes. So. No one really. Um, we're going in overtime, baby. Or excuse me, you know, that's not proper terminology. Extra period. Um, period. Brian, I, I really love that idea about the officiating class, and you know, I know not just basketball, but I know um, my our there's just good friend of mine. I know that's just a nightmare for him trying to get officials. I mean, you know, again, even you know, soccer, other things. So I love that idea of the officiating class a lot. Um, but, you know, a lot of the stuff that is mentioned, you know, we also, um, you know, do we have a um, a youth basketball league and we try to get our, our kids officiating, but pair them up with adult. And, and I just think, you know, um, you know, I think like Scott brought up a great point and even Woody, because I think Woody's spot on is that, you know, you can get these kids to officiate and then you get to them in a great Northwest, which isn't really controlled by the school. You know, we're like, I love what you talked about, Brian, the two plus one program, and you make that announcement, but that's kind of controlled during a JV game or whatever. But Great Northwest, Great Northwest, there's really not administrators there. Um, and that's not a controlled environment. So I think when you have young officials, you let someone put in a group chat, you want to set them up for success by pairing them up with an adult that is going to be able to handle some parents, if they're going to get on this young, young man and, and mentor him a little bit, but, you know, I, I, so I think that's, was a great point. And, and I think for me personally, like, I know I want to do a better job moving forward is like, you know, kids going off to school or not going off to school. I mean, if you could get them with the right system, the right association, the right mentors, what a great way to make some side money for gas for, spending money in college or whatever, you know? And uh, so I know me personally, I want to do more to promote my former players that don't go on to play athletics to encourage them to get involved. You know, like Scott said, he goes to just a game on the weekend, officially a lot of games. That's just great extra money, you know? So, um, but I just think, you know, again, cause I, I mean, I've heard, I think Woody made a really good point about, these young officials, if you put them in a bad environment, they'll never come back, you know? So. Yeah. And we can't, we can't eat our young. We have to grow them. You know, I know a lot of people are texting me right now. There's, oh. bad, there's some bad, there's some bad juju happening with the weather. So um, Scott, I want to get your insight before we uh, wrap up what's been the best meeting I've ever been affiliated with. And Brian, let's, let's, I want to one real quick, Say on real quick before Scott goes there. Um, on behalf of the Arrowhead, thank you to Scott and Scott and Brad, as well as Chad and Kevin for jumping in here. I know people are going to jump off because of the bad weather, but before that all happens, thank you on behalf of the Arrowhead and, and Tim and mm -hmm. I. And we do appreciate it. And, and there may only be 39 officials here, 
Chad, Kevin, and you guys over there. There's a lot more that participate. I hope you know that um, stuff happens. Record, we recorded this too, so yes, um, we'll send and, it out. And, and I, I, I know I'm willing to stick on as long as I, I you know, you said that Scott answered that, but I got one question. I really want to hear these five answers. If they can stick along, great. If not, well, but we'll, we'll let them go on. Well, I'll, I'll be, I'll be very, very brief. Then we do a lot of the things that that you guys already talked about as far as um, having some of our players ref three on threes and things like that. Um, but I, I think maybe this comes from an administrator standpoint, but um, one of the things I, I hit heavily on when it comes to my preseason meeting with my parents um, are, are two things that, that I am pretty blunt with is number one, don't coach your kids during the games. I don't want to, you know, I, there's a conflict that sometimes happens when, when you're telling them one thing, I'm telling them another, and that puts them in a very compromising situation. And number two is don't talk to the officials, don't yell at the officials. No, sometimes that falls on deaf ears, depending upon who, uh, who is sitting in the crowd at that time. But that is, that is an expectation that I give to my parents that I want them to, to do during our games. Um, because I've, I've seen that happen and it's it's an uncomfortable situation um, and sometimes embarrassing for the kid when their parent has to get talked to by a game manager or gets removed from the game by an official. Um, those are those are things that I talk about in my parent meeting that I try to, I guess, be a little bit blunt to them that I don't want them doing during the game. So I think as coaches, we can try to make the environment that we can control a little bit anyway, at least a good environment for the officials that do come into our building that are doing their best and, and trying to, you know, come in, come in, do their best without having a, a sour taste when they leave. So those are things that I try to do with my parents anyway. Thanks Scott. That's, <clears throat> that's so nice to hear. And just here's some ideas that have worked in the past and things that we really like as officials. And I hope I'm speaking for, you know, everyone here that's uh, still on the call. Um, I love when a little kid brings me water during a timeout. Like that is so cool. Like, thank you. And I might say no thanks. Uh, but you know, have a kid stand on each end of the floor. And when they see the referees go to the block only for full timeouts, you know, I'll come over there with, uh, with water for, you know, the one official on one block and the two on the other or whatever it might be. And that's just really cool. Um, treat bags for the refs. Like sometimes we don't stop and eat uh, because we're being rushed or we're working late and we want to get to the game an hour before. Uh, I know Nasita used to do this um, down in our area. They would do treat bags with a little handwritten note from a leadership class or student council. That means a lot to referees. We remember those things. So take a little extra time to put together like a, like a water flavor packet, um, a little bottle of shampoo. You'd be surprised how many times, man, Tim, I forgot my shampoo. Like I can't shower without shampoo. And oh, there's a little bottle of shampoo that I got in my treat bag last week. I'm going to use that. Um, you know, a granola bar or a power bar or something that means a lot to us. Um, have your booster club pay for people to get trained. Maybe Booster clubs would step up and provide Culver's value meal coupons for the referees or quick trip. Um, quick trip is always willing to donate. Like even those, those meals, those take home meals stock up on some of those, have somebody throw them in the microwave after the game and say, here you go. This is a hot meal for you to eat on your way out the door. That's like, wow. Thank you. Cause I was going to stop at quick trip anyway, but now I don't have to. And we remember that and we want to go back to those schools and work because of those things. Don't give us a warm bottle of water. Like I, you know, I'm sorry, but that is just not good enough. Um, and it's nice to get towels. It's nice to have a chair with a little note uh, and a treat bag. I just like seeing that stuff. Um, so those are just some little tidbits and anything uh -oh. else. Anything else? Unfortunately, unfortunately, these five don't have much to do with that. It's the ADs, but I. Oh, I mean, yes, it, they do. It, yes, they do. Well, they do. They do. Oh, they do. Oh, yes, they do. Correct. Yes. Correct. Um, I mean, I, like I said, 
I appreciate all five of you and, and respect it all. Absolutely. And I, know we, I know we've lost a lot. I'll be the last one to sign off. I'll be here with Brian Kenny all night long, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, as long as I got all five of you, I want to know as long as the rest of the everyone else wants to know. When you guys communicate with us, what's your objective? Now, there's two different things. It's it's the hey, you know what? That was a travel, that was a travel, that was a travel. Minor stuff. And then there's major stuff. What is your objective? What are you trying to get across? Are you trying to gain a call? Are you trying to influence a call? Are you arguing a call? What what what's your objective when you are communicating Constantly. with an official? First first one to chime in gets to go first. <laughs> I'll go first then. Um, when I, when I saw this question, I, it, you know, honestly, it kind of stopped me in my tracks, to be honest, like it, it made me think like, okay, what, what, you know, and I, I think into like this year's games, I'm like, so why, why do I, you know, initiate conversation or, or like you say, conversation with, with an official. And, and I think it's different thing. Like a lot, a lot of times it might be like, Hey, I thought that was a travel, you know, and like I said, hopefully I'm respectful about it if I am questioning a call, but also clarification type things too. Like, you know, what, what, like the one I mentioned, I'm like, I, I thought this was the rule. What, um, but you know, there, there's times too, where I'm just seeing if the official will communicate with me too. Um, you know, what kind of night is it, is it going to be, you know, are, are they, you know, cause I, if, if somebody isn't going to, communicate with me then i'm probably just gonna shut up and know i gotta just you know <laughs> keep keep to myself tonight because it's not gonna you know uh not gonna go the way i want it to go but yeah it, so, honestly so, so real, real quick chad on that on that note so if you have an official that does not communicate with you are you less likely to uh, argue or I use argue as a quotation a call like like say so so now I'm I'm officiating a game and, and you're yelling at me, hey, hey official, you know my name. Doesn't travel, doesn't travel. I, I ignore you. Are you less likely to argue with me or are you trying to gain that conversation? Um it, that's a that's a good question too. I and and I don't know. I think a lot of times I just question things out of instinct. You, you know, like like I'm probably not quite as passionate and into the games as, as a few uh, coaches here, but you are coach, you know, you're just coaching and it's instinctive to like, Hey, Hey, what travel or, or you know? Um, and yeah, if a, an official, I, I guess I'm probably not going to just quit questioning if they don't acknowledge me, but um, it, it depends too on their demeanor. Are they going to be that guy that's just going to tee me up without a warning because they're, you know, <laughs> Um, so you, you, you know, you kind of worry about that stuff too, but, uh, uh, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, this was, this was a very good question and I, I was kind of hoping we wouldn't get to it cause there's really, uh, kind of question about, I, I bet it's probably because I disagree with a call is why I probably initiate the initial conversation, which is, is obviously making me think a little bit more, maybe the next game, how I go about things. <laughs> All right, who else we got? I'd like to go no, next. No. Then I got to get off. But right. um, for me, it's it's two different things. Number one, I, I would initiate contact just to, to seek to understand what are they seeing, how are they going to call it. If it's you know if it's something I'm not seeing that they're doing, I just want to know what they're seeing or why they're calling it a certain way. I typically don't get upset about that. I just want to know, hey, so what's going on? What what are you seeing? Why are you calling that? Those types of things. And then this, the second part, it, and it doesn't happen very often with me, is frustration that comes out with repeated, seems to be repeated missed calls that don't go in your favor or don't go your way that sometimes lead to inconsistencies. Like I said, I typically don't show those emotions too much with with officials because, I, you know, as a former official, I've been in those shoes, so I, I, I somewhat understand that. But 
but that's typically the two forms of communication that I have. But number one, I just want to understand what you're seeing or why you're calling it a certain way. Whatever that is, just let me know. And then I can talk to my players about adjusting to that uh, because that's one of the things I talk to my kids about is you have to feel out the officials too. Not, you know, sometimes, sometimes we say officials aren't necessarily consistent, but maybe what we mean is they're not consistent from crew to crew. You still have to be, uh, officials are going to be different on different nights. You have some times have to adjust to them and how they're going to call the game as well. Um, but like I said, sometimes that frustration boils over with inconsistencies of how it's being called within the game itself. So those are the two typical things that I talk to officials about. One of the, one of the things that I often hear in our business is assistant coaches are to be seen and not heard. And, and I don't agree with that. I, I look at an assistant coach as they're a coach and they deserve my humanity also. So I don't mind talking to assistants, but so a good example is I had a game um, the other night where there were two very active assistant coaches and they were wanting to talk to me about a potential illegal screen. And it wasn't enough for an illegal screen because the defender wasn't doing anything to counteract the screener. So it was basically incidental contact and moving the, screen. Assist, yeah, moving screen. Yeah. The, the two assistants were harping on me simultaneously. And the, the head coach was watching something else, never said a word to me. And I just turned around and I said, I, if you don't see me blow my whistle or hear me blow my whistle for an illegal screen, it is not an illegal screen. I'm not going to revisit this play with either of you. Please stop. And that was all I needed to say. And I didn't have to say anything to the head coach. I didn't need to say, you know, you're an assistant. You just keep track of the timeouts. Um, that's just unprofessional, in my opinion, to dismiss assistant coaches just because they're not the head coach. Now, I could say to the head coach, you know, coach, I'm, I'm having a really hard time listening to you because I have to listen to your assistants too. So can you please help me? Uh, I think, you know, those kind of conversations are things we have to do if we're trying to get better. That's just a thought from, from me. You know, and also on the old, like, what you're trying to get across when you communicate with officials. Yeah, I can, I can go next here. Um, I think for one is um, thank you. I have, a, I have a genuine interest in, you know, I see the game through probably a one-sided lens a lot of the times, you know, so I think that helps me if, if I can get a response. Um, I think it helps me step back and be like, yep, okay, I'm just seeing it one-sided. Um, but then the second thing is, I think us as coaches also want officials to be held accountable. And I don't think we really know how to um, hold officials accountable. Obviously this, what you guys do with this association, why you know I'm such a fan of it and really wish we had one in our area is because you guys hold each other accountable through these clips. You watch them, you, you learn, you grow. And, and that's what we want as, as coaches. Um, but, you know, how do we, if, if you can't back up why you called something, how do we know that you are being held accountable for something? Just as us as coaches are held accountable, just as players are, are, are held accountable. Um, so I think that's where you see the, the frustration is sometimes we feel like there's no penalty if, you know, we're, we're inconsistent with the whistle. Um, so that's, I think, the frustration that, that coaches just try to get out. Um, and, and I think that that's part of what we try to convey, not necessarily to change a call. Brad, I'll say on, uh, it's like to say you don't know who I am, correct? If I came to officiate your game, you'd be like, who's this guy, correct? Correct. Okay. Hey, hey, six pack. Hey, six pack. No, yeah. Nick pack. What I, what I want to say is, is this: as officials, when we walk into a game, when we got your game, Brad. We don't know your game from Scott Egan's game. 
we have we don't we don't care if you win or or Scott wins. We're here to call a fair game. We don't know these two teams from side to side. Now, granted, if I walk in and I got Chad's game versus Kevin's game, I know both of them. However, our integrity jumps in there. And hopefully, as coaches, you learn that our integrity jumps in there. But that's where I was wanting to like, hey, we're not black and white. It was black and white, but we, we see the gray. And that's, and that's again, exactly what you're saying is what you want, but what we see is we're not, we're not for you. We're not against you. We're just here to, to be fairness to the game. Yeah. And I think that, that the good officials, you know, that that's their goal, right? They don't want to have an impact on the outcome of a game, just like us as coaches. We don't want to negatively, you know, impact the outcome of, of a game. And, and I think there's mutual respect for the officials that um, are trying to do it that way. Other Scott or Kevin chime in about this? No, and I would definitely echo what, like, Scott's last, last comment is just, like, I, I think that was spot on. And, and uh, you know, um, you know, like, for me, I mean, I talk to the officials a lot and, and – um, and hopefully a lot of it's good conversations, but, you know, um, I don't think I have an agenda behind it, but like, just if you have a question, you're like, what did you see there or whatever? And they come back, Oh, I saw this. Or, you know, um, you know, the other night, you know, I had a player curl through the lane and I thought he got grabbed and I talked to him and, you know, I'm like, Hey, just keep your eye on number, you know, whatever. It looks like he's like grabbing us when we're coming off the stream and, you know, just, having that kind of little bit of dialogue type of thing, you know? Um, and I know you guys got a tough job to do. And, and uh, I really appreciate, like you said, you're just, Hey, you want the the best from, from everyone. And the integrity part I think is, is awesome. You know, I think that's really, really good. Got you getting anything else or on that? Um, no, I think most of the guys hit it on the head. You know, I, I, I will say I do, do, I do appreciate when officials like come to you and say, Hey, this is why I made this call this way. Like I just like a lot of the guys have said the dialogue, the communication, like that, because I, yeah, I like, if they say that, I'll be like, you know, okay, you, you have a reason for your call. I think that's really, you know, um, that's a really important. And I, I just have always appreciated officials where whatever the reason is, they say, Hey, this is why I made this call. And usually I'm, I'm good with that. You know, as long as they're willing to support their call, I am always very appreciative of that. And I think that shows confidence in what they're doing. And I think that makes me, you know, trust them the rest of the game a lot more. So just like a lot of the guys said, and I think a common theme tonight has been communication between coaches and, and officials. And like, that really makes everybody a lot happier both ways. It sounds like for the most part. So, so I, I, um, I run a part-time uh, leadership and team building business on the side. And one of the things that I talk about a lot with sports teams and the coaches that I work with is, you know, that all of us being humans are going to go catabolic. And then we're also going to be anabolic. So like catabolic behavior is responding with anger and body language, you know, deteriorates and starts to go, go south. And I look at my job as an official is when I see coaches that are catabolic because it's going to happen. It's emotional, right? The game is, it's intense and you're going to have it happen. I got to get them back to an anabolic place. And I take that pretty seriously. So if a coach is really upset, I'm going to try to get them to not be upset. I'm not going to feed into their catabolic behavior by being catabolic myself that's just stupid I mean that's just that's a lose-lose you know Stephen Covey says that's the worst place you can be is a lose-lose so I think that's really important for us as officials to kind of get coaches to say hey coach I, I don't want to revisit this play anymore can we talk about something else um, you know I've already given you a reasonable explanation can I move on please and thank you I say the please and thank you all the time. And coaches are like, are you using manners with me? Like, it's just like, 
it kind of like dissolves the argument, you know? So this has been really helpful. Um, Brian, I hate to stop you there real quick, but I, I, I want to ask Scott and Brad and more importantly than Chad and Kevin, because I know they got a lot of stuff, but questions you might have of us, like what, I know, I know we just, we, we threw a ton of questions at you. We might, some of we didn't ask, but what questions might you have from us as two associations? Like, what are you looking for? Anything, throw it out there. It's your one chance. Only chance, Chad. You know, honestly, for me, I think we hit a lot of spots tonight. It's, and it's all, the nice thing about these meetings is you reflect on our coaching as well. At least I did when we have these conversations, I think it's really good to get to know <laughs> officials thinking. Like, I, I think it just makes you reflect on like your treatment of them, like what, you know, what they, you know, that type of stuff. And so as we've talked about this stuff, I go, man, how can I adjust what I'm doing as a coach, as far as, as um, addressing officials and things like that. And so I don't really have a lot more that I want to say. I think you guys answered a ton tonight and um, I, I really appreciated a lot of the other coaches insight uh, insights and, just appreciate you guys having me on so I can learn and, and professionally develop myself as well. Um, Cause this has been really good for me as a coach. So I, I don't have anything else to add right now. Yeah. Thanks Scott. Yeah. And I don't want to take the easy way just, out and say, I just you know, want to say thanks a lot. I thought this was really, really good. Um, I mean, it made me think a lot. Um, I just picked up a lot of great things. Um, and uh um, just thank you for let me be part of it. Hey, Brian, could I get your phone number? Yeah, I'll put it in the chat. Awesome. Yeah. Go do it, Brian. Thank you. <laughs> I got to get going, but uh, I, thank you very much. And, and uh, have a good uh, rest of the season, guys. Thanks, Kevin. Kevin, I sent you a direct message. One thing I would say, coaches, is like, you know, statements versus a question. You make a statement at me, we're trained by people that train us not to answer statements or acknowledge statements. But if you ask a polite question, when are you asking it? Is it an appropriate time? And the one thing, one question I want to get out, do you guys know pri primary coverage area of the officials? It's like, do you know whose call it was supposed to be based on where it occurred on the floor? I, w I would say I probably don't know exactly, but, um, you know, I'm uh, I'm usually not the guy that's going to say that's not your call either, though. So because <laughs> I kind of I, I guess and that's where you're going with this. But, um, you know, I, it happened the other night where I, I saw a girl double dribble and I was it was in front of our bench. And I said, well, that was a double. That, was that a double dribble? And, and the guy in front of me said I couldn't see it because he was behind her but that was the guy that I was next to. And, and after I thought of him, I'm like, yeah, he probably couldn't see it. So, but then obviously that's not his call. It was probably the guy on the other side's call <laughs> who didn't see it obviously. And, and, you know, um, but no, I, I, I don't know exactly who's supposed to call primary calls where, what, but. So what, if, Chad, so what if I say during a game, I'm referring with, with Jeremy over here. And I say, Hey, Chad, uh, Jeremy's right there. That's I trust Jeremy's call. He'll be over here. He's gonna he'll, he'll explain to you what he saw. What do you got? Well, I I, I like that too. That it, you know, if it isn't yours, and and you know, um, you know, and, and I don't I don't need an answer then. But yeah, if you guys talk during a timeout, hey, Chad was wondering what 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 you see down there on that one. Um, it, it actually happened this year where uh, I had a girl in the post and a, and a gal just from behind, you could see her arm. She's standing behind her and just punched them through and followed my girl from behind. I said, and I could see it from my view. And the guy in front of me was like, kind of like, well, that's, he, I, the girl was behind her. I couldn't see. And the other official actually ran by me. He goes, my bad coach. I, I should have called that. I saw, you know, so he kind of, he kind of heard me, but again, for them to come by and say, Hey, sorry. Yeah, that was that. You're right. That was slow. I, I missed that one. I'm like, Hey, no problem, whatever. But, uh, so yeah, I, I, if it's not your call or in the, I'm, I'm fine with that as long as, long as we're going to communicate about it. If you know, 
And you All guys right, talked it, about it. The, Scott, the, Scott, Scott, I got the same view you got. Scott, I saw what you saw. However, Brian is right there. And you know what? He's got a he, – it's his call. I'm 80% sure it was a foul like you, but Brian had no call. <laughs> what do you got, Scott? Um, if you, yeah, I mean, I, I get that. I, it's obviously frustrating, you know, especially when official says something like to, that to me, because, you know, if you got two on one, it, it's, it's frustrating, but, you know, again, I, uh, I, um, I, first of all, I do, I have actually, when Cade came and ran his clinic, I was helping supervise the kids. And so he actually put up cones and stuff to show us all the different positions. So he could teach the kids what, what areas they called. So that was really good for me actually as a coach to be at that clinic as well um, to see that. And I think it'd really be good for a lot of coaches to go to officiating clinics, even if they don't plan on officiating just so they learn some of that stuff. Um, but uh but yeah, I mean, you know, everyone's got a different angle of it. And I think every angle is going to look a little bit different to everybody. I just think like it's, it, it's so hard for everybody. And I think that's why, um, you know, I, I think there has to be some trust. I think, and I think official officials can create that trust with coaches, but I think there's gotta be like you guys have mentioned all night, the coaches have to trust that the refs know what they're doing for the most part. And, uh, if, and especially if the refs have built that relationship, even if you don't know them, if they've kind of, you know, been very fair with you. Um, I think that's where we, you know, have to, you know, make sure they know what they're doing, I guess. Like they, and, you know, and you guys do, you get, you can tell you guys study this all the time. So this is important to you. So um, yeah, but yeah, obviously sometimes when officials say that it's still frustrating to me when they say, yeah, that's how I saw it too. But it was, you know, so I get where you're when coming you, from. I, what I, do I, you guys say? Like, the, like defending a call, like if you say you got to be able to defend a call. Well, you know, if I, like, like you said, the guy was trailing the play on that one and he didn't see it, you know, because he maybe was out of position a little bit or whatever. You know, like, we want to be able to defend our calls. If I – if I, you want me to call what I think happened, that's a slippery slope. You know, like, yeah, did she maybe double drill? I thought she did, you know, but can I say she did without, a, you know, any fraction of doubt in my mind? No, I can't, so I can't make that call. Yeah, just so you, you know, coaches are aware, this is – this is the three-person coverage area on the right, so you can see the – you know, the trail official trailing the play obviously has the biggest um, coverage area and they have that sideline and then they have the division line and then the lead official has that yellow kind of area. So normally a three pointers in the corner, you would very rarely would you see the lead official, you know, covering those plays and then the center official has part of the lane and then pretty much the, the lane line extended up to midcourt. That's just our general PCA, the primary coverage areas. And I think it's important for us to know stuff about what you do and you, for you to know stuff about what we do. And if I could have my wish, I would love for the officials to have a bigger presence in the Wisconsin Basketball Coaches Association. That's, that's something that needs to happen. So if any of you have any strings to pull there, get our voices there. There's never any sessions where officials can sit down and talk with coaches about plays. We just don't, I, I, I've, I've never seen it happen literally because every year I look in the program to see like, are there any officials that are ambassadors within this organization? The answer is no, that's a problem. That's a, a white elephant that we need to address is to get more closeness between referees and and coaches, and that could be a place to do that because it's a huge, I mean, that's like birds flying south, right? I mean, you guys fly south to go to the JAG to collaborate with your fellow coaches, and, and meanwhile, we don't, you know, we have no presence there. Um, so if you have any, you know, Ch Chad, you've been doing this a while. Maybe you have a voice there. Um, talk to somebody. You know, get well, it, it's funny. Say, I just uh, uh, Northwood's head coach for the girls, uh, Schultz, I can forget his first name because I'm kind of new up there here, but uh, he said he's on the WBCA board, so um, I might have to reach out to him because, yeah, because as, as we're talking, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, obviously, you know, the, the five of us coaches that are on here, you guys, you know, 
must think we uh, are, are respectful why we're on the sidelines. Uh, but I, I just see so many coaches that are not. And my thought is, well, how do we, how do we get those guys to, or gr- gals to become more respectful and understand what, what the job that you guys are doing. And, and, and it's just, but I think that's a great idea. Have, have a clinic and have you guys speak at a WBCA board meeting. Uh, or not at a board meeting, but at the clinic down at the JAG. And, um, you know, maybe, maybe you know, just like tonight, I think we all learned stuff um, as coaches. Uh, may, maybe you would get the attention of some of those coaches that uh, that you know that you just don't want to ref their games. <laughs> Ch- Chad, um, yeah, we appreciate refing you, first of all. I know I speak on behalf of Arrowhead, when we say that, as well as Kevin dropped off. I officiated a game last night with a coach you, we don't like. I showed it to you know, numerous times. Be very sensitive. Warn him. Should have teed him up. <laughs> I hope you coaches know we don't want to tee up. We don't want to right. steal. So the best thing we could do as officials is walk out of the gym and not know who was there. Absolutely. And, and <laughs> so. So we appreciate the coaches that are not on our side, but understand the game of officiating. So thank you. Yeah, you yeah, yeah, thank you guys. Here. And because and, and, you guys are, are learning as well. Oh, it, guys, it, it, awesome. it's, 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 you took three hours out of your night tonight to see our side of it, which some officials don't care, or some coaches don't care about our side. So again, we appreciate all you guys did. Yeah, yeah. this has been great. Yeah, I've enjoyed and, uh, it. Thank you guys for having us, for sure. Yeah, and uh, we probably should, you know, end this thing. Unfortunately, we uh, we probably have people that need to go to bed, and <laughs> anybody that's a, anybody that's a teacher is probably wore out. Um, <laughs> you know, need need to. This is great. Hopefully, we can party again Bye. with Arrowhead. Um, Bye. It's a great association. You guys are kind of doing the same things that we are trying to get people better and you guys have a good network. So what do you Thanks for organizing everything a night up there and Bruce, you know, Wayne Clark, Jeff, I recognize some, some faces. Don, I saw Don is on there. Uh, Doug We're only about 20 minutes out from uh, up here. So watching it on the TV. <laughs> Yeah, yep. I just I just opened the door up and you can hear the wind rustling and it's yep. she's a coming. Yeah, we had a severe thunderstorm that just rolled uh, through Colfax. Yep. Have a Merry Christmas. Thanks for everything tonight. It was great. I appreciate it. Clark, on behalf of on behalf of the Arrowhead, did your did your child have oh you're a grandfather? I haven't seen Not a picture yet. yet. Not yet. Not so, yet. So, no. so, so, so Corey Oates, a fellow official. A lot of you know Corey Oates, his wife had gotten Today. He, he sent a Snapchat about a half hour ago. He was drinking beer and eating pizza in the uh, <laughs> That's no in different. the hospital room. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> Nothing yet. <laughs> thanks wow. coaches for doing this. Uh, Brian, have a good night. Nick, thanks for your time with it. Uh, I've got to sign off as well. Have a good night. Thanks, Thank you, guys. Thanks, Take guys. Care. All right, everyone, have a great night. We'll uh, we'll see everyone down the road. Hopefully, uh, I get to see some people this summer at camp, and get to see some uh, Northwest officials somewhere down the road. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks Brian, for having me. Take care, guys. Yeah, you Take too. care, guys. Thank you. Yep. Looking forward to seeing you at a game, Chad. I think we have you guys this year coming up. Ah, so, all right. I hope so. <laughs> Take care. Take care, everyone. Yep. Have a great night. Hey, guys. See you, Brian. See ya.